I'm calling the April 14th, 2020 Select Board meeting to order. And I'm just trying to coordinate my props in the background. There we go. So we're running our meeting remotely, available to the public on RCTV channel 22 uh, on Comcast Xfinity and channel 33 on Verizon. We're also being broadcast on Facebook Live, which you can access from the RCTV website. Each week, our agenda and packet are posted to the town website, which is www.readingma.gov, G-O-V. Emails sent to the board are posted to the packet if received before the posting date. If received after that date, they'll be posted in the next packet. We encourage public participation by sending an email to selectboard at ci.reading.ma.us. We will monitor this account during the meeting uh, and time permitting, we'll read out the comments. Please be sure to provide your name and address with your email and consistent with our uh, public participation policy uh, in person, no political. First thing tonight, I want to thank our first responders, medical workers and all essential service employees working in the grocery, pharmacy, food and other industries who are keeping us safe and with essential services during this pandemic. I was in a virtual meeting with members. Oh, excuse me, I'm just inviting Karen to come in here. She'll be in a moment. I was in a virtual meeting with members of the command unit on Monday, and I continue to be impressed with the leadership, the support staff, and the many volunteers that are working hard, planning, and working together so well. On behalf of the community, thank you again. By the way, when you can, please offer these folks support. They see and appreciate the thank yous that are being put up in people's windows. And if you see them in the street, please say thank you, but of course at a safe distance. I have up on the screen right now the resources that we shared uh, at the last few meetings. If you or anyone you know needs additional help, um, these are contacts that they can use to reach out for help. Of course, if it's an absolute emergency, it's 911. For other activities, you can see here the town website, uh, different emails for specific activities, as well as a phone number. And please feel free to reach out as, as you need to. Tonight, we have a very full agenda, which will start with an update on the COVID-19 situation in town. Emmy Dove, the chair of the Reading Board of Health, will is joining us to offer some updates. And then Town Manager Bob Lasher will offer his comments as well. Next will be Select Board Liaison Reports, followed by the Town Manager Update. We will offer a public comment session if people send us emails now. And as I mentioned, we'll also try to monitor comments during the meeting. At 8 p.m., we ha have a public hearing on parking scheduled. We do not have an acceptable approved format for public hearings when we're not meeting in person. And the board will discuss closing this previously scheduled hearing at this time and offering a brand new hearing at a future date. Community development will provide some updates on the road diet and other issues. The board will discuss how to handle public hearings temporarily with the goal of having town council return to us a policy to adopt in the next few weeks. Next annual report on the Human Rights Ad Hoc Committee. Town moderator Alan Foles will join us to discuss postponing of town meeting, which is something virtually all 351 communities in the Commonwealth are dealing with now as well. We will then discuss the recall election. Next, we will discuss and vote on select board liaison assignments, vote to appoint our, our vast volunteer appointment subcommittee, and then discuss encouraging residents to volunteer for boards and committees. We'll then receive an update from the communications subcommittee and close the evening with a discussion of future meeting topics. Uh, we may need to take a break at some point in the agenda. So board members, you can let me know uh, if you need a break uh, and or at some point I will try to, to call one just to, to kind of stretch for a moment and get out of our chairs. Um, with that, if I could, let me turn this over to Emmy Dove, Chair of the Board of Health, to share some updates uh, from the board. Please, Emmy. Hi, thanks, Mark. Um, so we do have a number of updates. Uh, the first update is on um, Friday, the board voted to require uh, owners and management, um, uh, management companies of uh, multifamily residence buildings to um, report or notify residents of um, positive cases uh, in their buildings. So this is uh, primarily targeted at multifam larger multifamily buildings with common areas such as um, hallways or uh, elevators. 
and uh, that notification, I believe, went out today. I don't know. <laughs> yes, okay, went out today. Um, and we supplied a template letter. Um, we want to make sure that obviously patient privacy is adhered to. So um, that went out today. Uh, the second update is we have worked on restructuring our public health response system. So I know a couple weeks ago I mentioned concerns about nurse staffing levels. And uh, last week, a uh, fellow board member, Kevin Sexton, presented um, or updated you guys to let you know that we um, we had access to a larger network of school nurses uh, from our public school system. Uh, so now we've uh, worked on uh, better organizing that. So um, the goal, and we're partway towards this goal, is to have the health agency the software reporting system may then and she'll de be delegating cases caseloads to various nurses we have the public health nurse who is maven trained and has um, uh, login credentials and we have the director of nursing at the school uh, reading public schools uh, who is also Maven trained and has login credentials. So they're going to be doing the bulk of the data management. Um, and then we have two nurses, additional nurses, one in elder services and uh, another one from the public schools who will be trained in Maven and given um, uh, acquiring uh, login credentials so that they can serve as backups in case something happens with our first two nurses, just to make sure that we never have a system where we run out of people who can ac access the system. And then we have additional uh, school nurses who will be doing outreach, which will be the monitoring of, um, of cases. So uh, cases in um, those in quarantine. So the check-in, um, uh, the, ch the check-in requirements. Luckily, the state has actually cut back on the requirements, the monitoring requirements for those in quarantine. So actually, we only have to reach out to them once a week instead of daily. So that really cuts down on the workload. Uh, fellow board member Eleanor Shankoff actually had started um, plotting our case numbers so we can see uh, the trajectory and it appears right now we're on a linear trajectory rather than an exponential trajectory, which is very good news. Hopefully it continues that way or goes down. Um, so that leads me to uh, reporting numbers. This is something that is, I think, a little bit in flux. We haven't received a lot of guidance from the state in terms of how to report. Um, there are a number of metrics that you can report. Um, that's uh, the cumulative number of cases. Uh, so anyone who's ever tested positive in Reading, that's the active cases. So the people who are currently in isolation, the recovered cases. So people who had been in isolation and are now out, um, deaths, and then the number of individuals who are currently being monitored in quarantine, and then those who have come out of quarantine. Um, you'll find every town is doing something different. So uh, maybe about a month ago, I think Needham decided not to report any numbers. And they did that because they felt it gave, seeing low numbers gave residents a false sense of security. Uh, the state did, um, uh, on a call with local health departments suggest or recommend that we stop reporting numbers entirely uh, and that we only report countywide numbers. And I think that was due to um, privacy concerns, uh, less of a concern in a larger population than in a smaller population. And consequently, some towns did decide to stop reporting numbers. Um, but if you look around at different municipalities, you'll see it's all over the board. 
we have at the moment anyway decided to report cumulative cases and active cases so the gap between those is um, the number of individuals who have recovered or and the number of individuals who have died uh, we are not reporting deaths at this time uh, they are happening um, i don't know that it's a useful metric for residents um, other than to know that it, it, it is happening reading is no less susceptible than any other community um, but we just um, you know believe that there are some privacy concerns there and um, out of respect for the families we we prefer not to report those at this time um, our next steps will be educational outreach. And I, I have mentioned that, I think two weeks ago, I had mentioned that, Kevin mentioned that last week. We're, we're still in the process. You know, as other things come up, they take precedence. But um, with, uh, you know, ideas working with town staff about what the right platform for that might be. Our goal is to do something routine, um, sort of a series, really. Uh, we, for some new stuff, we have um, just found out yesterday that our health agent has a contact who has access to a lot of PPE for purchase. So um, I, uh, our health agent, Laura, has been in touch with Chief Burns and there are ongoing discussions about what we might wanna do with that if we, if we wanna purchase, how much we wanna purchase, what the uses would be for that. Uh, and we also did receive um, $7,500 from the state for very targeted um, uses such as surge staffing. Thank you. <laughs> such as um, surge staffing and um, isolation and quarantine. So uh, we'll be discussing how best to use those funds uh, in the coming days. Anyone have any questions? Amir, are you feeling that our uh, public health nurse staffing and, and backup support with Maven Access is adequate at this time? Um, I do. I, I was in touch with Mary Juliana, who's the, um, the director of nursing with the public schools. And she's feeling much more confident about the situation now. Uh, I think it was a steep learning curve, but um, she's feeling like she's got her feet under her. And, um, and I spoke to the health agent both yesterday and today, and both times she was feeling very positive and optimistic about where we stand. Excellent, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Emmy, this is Carlo. Do you uh, do the uh, first uh, fire, police, and first responders have enough PPEs currently? Um, I think that's a concern, particularly for police. Um, and you know, part of the issue is for the um, certain types of PPE that we do have. They can't all use them because you need um, training for the respirators, um, the N95s. You need actual proper training for that. Um, so I think it's always a concern. Um, I know that they've had sufficient um, supplies to be able to give some to some of the long-term care centers um, who have who have needed them, um, but. But I think it's always going to be a potential issue. Is there any guidance from the state if they can get caught up? Are they? Are they? I, mean, I know everyone's struggling to to get them. So um, the state, I don't believe, is providing directly PPE to communities. Uh, I do know that I, so I do, actually don't know the details on this and this would have to be a question really for Chief Burns or, or Chief Clark, but I, I believe there was a PPE survey that went around to um, fire and police. Um, so I don't know if they have another 
uh, access point. For health departments, um, there are there, sometimes we get do get um, funding sources. Um, we did not take advantage of the last round or the, the first round, I should say, um, uh, because the town was um, was going through facilities for their purchasing because facilities has greater purchasing power and they have a, a they have a better uh, d different suppliers who uh, so they can get things at a reduced cost. Um, uh, so the town decided to go that route. Um, we did therefore though miss out on some funds specifically for that. Um, I anticipate more funds coming, but I don't know. Okay, thanks. Can I just follow up on that for a second? It sounded like you're saying, Emmy, that um, maybe we could use more training on proper use of PPE. In Yeah, that would be a question for Chief Burns. I I know that that his um, th certainly the I assume that all the paramedics all have training in in the respirators. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean I've had it because of my personal my, my day job. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it. You, you typically have to make sure that there's a, a really good seal. And so um, a lot of places actually you have to go somewhere to a facility where they actually test to make sure that you're getting that, that full seal. Um, and I don't know the process. I think we are, that's something that uh, the command unit will be actually talking about in the coming weeks. Great. Are there board member questions, comments from? Um, sure, Mark. Um, Emmy, thank you very much for the update. Um, I'm wondering if there's any other calls for assistance that are maybe going into elder elder services. Are you seeing an increase in anything like that? So I don't have a whole lot of information on that. I do know that they've um, had a number of calls. This is probably actually a question that's better for Bob, maybe, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um but I, I, I mean, I, I think they've been working around, uh, around the clock. They, they've been working very, very hard. Um, uh, and I think I expect that there will be more calls as things progress and as people are out of work for longer amounts of time. Bob, do you wanna pick up on that? Sure, Amy, are you all set? Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll pick up on that uh, first and <clears throat> excuse me while I just read something from Chief Burns. Uh, and this was in response to uh, a couple of questions from board members. Um, in the early stages, which he points out is the week before last, um, PPE of all kinds was in short supply. Our three elderly care facilities did not have a sufficient supply and we did supply PPE to the staff in these facilities in Reading. We continue to monitor the level of supply to ensure they don't run out. Um, so specifically that response is for the staff at the elder care places, not for the patients. Um, that's up to the establishment themselves, depending on the medical condition uh, of the patients. Um, he also checked with fire chiefs in surrounding communities to see what they were doing if different. Um, North Reading, um, Melrose, Wakefield, Linfield, Winchester, and Stoneham replied. As you know, as you heard, I think it was last week, the Wilmington Board of Health did supply masks to small businesses. Uh, Stoneham and Winchester supplied PPE to elderly care facilities, similar to what Reading did. Uh, Linfield and Melrose did not supply any PPE, and North Reading supplied only some disinfecting wipes to a funeral home. So there's a wide range of access to supplies and sort of distribution of supplies. Um, the most important part in the last two weeks, I'll say, has really to keep a care, keep an eye on the elder care facilities with dense just housing. Um, you know, we've seen some pretty horrific headlines from other communities, very sad stories. And the fire department uh, has been terrific in terms of going up there and visiting 
about every two days, just to make sure. And when I say visiting, I don't mean just asking at the front desk. I mean walking around every floor and observing what they're trained to observe as EMTs and as especially uh, ALS providers and to really uh, see what's going on. And they're very satisfied that our facilities are doing a good job. Um, you know, maybe a little caught off guard with the PPE two weeks ago, but so was most people. So that part seems good. Um, <clears throat> Mark and Emmy uh, participated Monday on the uh, command meeting. There's two other things to highlight. Uh, one is we finished all our goals um, from a couple weeks ago and uh, Greg being Greg assigned us seven more goals. So we'll, we'll be pretty busy. Um, some of those goals bear mentioning. Um, it may seem like far away, but there's three community events we need to discuss, uh, Memorial Day, Friends and Family Day, and even the Fall Street Fair. Um, I have heard informally at the state level that Memorial Day services are being strongly discouraged. Um, there will be uh, remembrance, but not physical presence for those services. So whether the governor or the state feels obliged to make a further about what the plans in Reading are. And then friends and family in June and the Fall Street Fair in September, um, you know, are not that far away from a planning standpoint. And uh, both of those events would gather very large crowds. So it's something to really consider this year. Um, even if um, the predictions for the peak come true in the next couple of weeks, um, I can't imagine that by September, we're gonna be acting the same way we did last September. So I think there's still gonna be a lot of caution. I know some of you over the weekend and early in the week have seen that some of the colleges are already thinking about postponing on-campus semesters for the fall because again, they really need to plan far and ahead. Um, so if they're thinking that way, certainly a fall street fair in September has to be a question. Um, the other thing that uh, is a large goal, and this is on the optimistic side, is a demobilization plan, or in this case, how to reopen, how to deal with the reopening whenever that happens. Um, we discussed at great length, and I won't go into it here, how to handle the businesses that reopen and the health inspections that will be needed. Um, that will be tricky. Um, the nurse issue, I think we handled pretty well and had a plan all along. I don't have a particularly good plan on how to help in this one. Um, we are going to need um, probably more uh, health inspection personnel than we have access to uh, if all the restaurants are suddenly going to open in a short amount of time. Um, and the other thing is how to reopen town buildings to the public. And that's something that uh, town department heads will be asked to think about over the next uh, couple weeks. Um, we know for sure that nothing is going to change, at least through the 4th of May. Uh, we believe the governor and the um, state will make some comments about school in the next 10 days, perhaps even later this week. Um, and one of the options is to bump that day out. Uh, if that date is bumped out, undoubtedly all the rest of the um, proclamations or, or orders are rather will also be moved out. So right now we're looking at three more weeks and again, you know, stay tuned in the next few days to see how far that goes. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank, um, I was gonna do this as part of my town manager's report, but we have received in the last two weeks over $5,000 of donations from residents. Um, extremely generous. Um, I don't wanna violate privacy, but some of the comments that have come along with them have been really quite, um, quite humble. Um, there's one family that is affected by this issue deeply, but they wanted to try to help other families prevent it. So they wanted to give money uh, for food and other needs. Um, a couple of residents specifically wanted to donate to first responders to public safety. And um, I asked them just to give to the food pantry. Uh, between the food pantry and Reading Human Elder Services, a lot of meals are being given out. We think that's an area that is going to increase uh, Jean was smart since she's up at four in the morning with the donut man any, anyways. She went to Market Basket last week at five o'clock and uh, somehow got out of there with a lot of toilet paper and, and her life. And um, she was able to pack 10 bags for residents and five were gone before noon. And we hadn't known there was any demand, but we just in instinctively knew that when, uh, when Greg worries about something, we need to all worry about it. And he was worried that we'd be caught off guard without having food and other supplies. So that's something, um, I know there's another effort that's gonna happen on Thursday and one on Friday in terms of replenishing and being prepared to supplement what the food pantry is doing. So again, thank you to all the residents that have donated 
and volunteered to do more. We certainly have a list. Um, we'll, we'll keep you in mind. But that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, Bob and Emmy, thank you both for those updates. Um, as far as the senior outreach that had been taking place, Bob, um, do you know if everyone who um, was listed for outreach has been contacted and if there's going to be an ongoing effort for that so that we check in on people regularly depending on how long this goes? I asked Jean that question, uh, I think it was yesterday, and she said that uh, Elder Human staff, Services staff have made the rotation through once and they're starting it up again either today or yesterday. So yes, the answer is it'll be ongoing. Great, fantastic. Um, and then on the subject of the food bank, um, it's wonderful to hear about all the donations that have come in. Um, what is, do you know what the food bank will be doing to support people that are um, going to be needing services um, in the coming weeks or months? So as people's circumstances change, um, will they be able to apply for those services The last I talked to the food pantry, they were really looked, looking out only about a week at a time and trying to make sure they could handle that. So I don't know if they've done any planning beyond that. And you know, if to the extent they haven't, they probably can't for another couple of weeks till we get through this difficult part. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and the last question is, Bob, as far as the friends and family and Memorial Day, do you need a decision from us about those? Um, I mean, if the state calls it, the state calls it, but. Um, is there anything that we can do to help you as we think ahead for those events? Well, right now, um, the governor's order uh, backed up by the local board of health would prohibit gatherings of 10 people. So if that's extended, that would take care of it. If it's not extended, that may be a local decision to, to make. So I, I'd certainly leave that up to the board of health and they may ask for your help. Um, other than that, uh, no, I, I would say Memorial Day is more in the town's hands with town staff. Um, there was a discussion. Um, I called Bill Brown yesterday. I, I missed him. Um, he thought maybe putting flags out on the common would be a nice gesture for this Memorial Day, uh, whereas normally they're in the, at the different graves in the five cemeteries. So he thinks that a lot of people don't even know about the flags because they don't visit all the cemeteries as many of you have. So there will be um, a celebration of sorts, a memorial celebration, but it may just look different this year. Great, thank you. Yep. Other board questions or comments? Um, I have a comment. I um, I did call Market Basket and Stop and Shop earlier this week, and I thank you, Bob, for and Jean for for going over there. And they have been super helpful. Um, as we were told, the food pantry really would like to welcome donations of Market Basket or grocery store gift cards. And um, Market Basket was happy to have us call them and they will mail them right to the food pantry, saving everybody leaving their homes and driving around. So um, thanks for the heads up that um, this may become more of a problem as we move on. Thanks, Karen. Other Can questions? I just say one more, <laughs> one more Please. thing, a glowing comment about Market Basket and Staff and Shop that they've been working really well with, um, with our health inspector and our health agent um, to try and deal with the issue of, you know, gloves being thrown on parking lots and putting up the plexiglass at registers. They're working really hard to, to try and, and keep things as safe as possible. So just wanted to shout out some good news. Thanks, Emmy. Any other questions or comments, board members? Nope. Okay, great. So let's, um, so Emmy, thank you very much for, for joining. You are more than welcome to stay for the duration or, or at your leisure to depart. <laughs> um, next on our list is select board liaison reports. Any reports that we want to, to share? So board of health, we already heard. Um, I don't think RMLD has met. Um, Bob gave command staff and public safety. I think that probably covers things unless, did I miss something? No, all good. Okay. Um, Bob, did you have any other non COVID-19 comments you wanted to share? I do, just a couple of things, thank you. Um, first, congratulations to the community development staff who somehow has found time uh, to write, uh, write another grant and win another $15,000 grant 
Awesome. It's phase two of the downtown district management. Great. So that's that's fabulous. That was uh, good news. Um, the second one, um, I wrote to our three um, local legislative delegation today and just advise them of the natural gas pipeline on Main Street and the repaving issue. Um, there's no definitive word, but um, Brad just sent me an email a few minutes before the meeting. Um, he said that um, a fellow John Lenacek is uh, that at MassDOT is gonna reach out to National Grid to set up a meeting to better understand the scope and schedule of the work. Um, it looks like National Grid, which I did not know, might be doing some replacement work on the Northern section of Main Street, as well as the South section. Um, so MassDOT has a very high priority of not digging up twice. So they believe they can work with them. John said his understanding of the gas line project um, is that the northern section will not impact Mass Dot's repaving project at all. The portion of the gas line project to the south of the town will include some overlap, but Mass Dot should be able to work it out with National Grid to make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, the resurfacing for Route 28 in the southern did fall. So the hope is National Grid should be able to finish its work uh, before the final pavement uh, layer goes down. So that would be terrific news. Um, I did hear from Senator Lewis um, and Representative Haggerty as well. I plan to uh, speak to Jason tomorrow, but um, clearly we did not want to have a paved Main Street be torn up to have a gas main put in. Um, so that's good news. Uh, and lastly, uh, for the board, and this will come up with a later agenda item, just so you know, the letters for your volunteers with terms expiring in June are ready to go out. So they're ready to go out tomorrow, depending on how your discussion tonight goes. Um, we've put in a deadline of April 27th to reply either with a, a letter to the town clerk's office or just an email back to the sender. So that's all I have. Thanks, Bob. Any board questions or comments on that? No. Um, all right, so uh, we had talked about opening here for public comment. Um, I only I checked a moment ago, I didn't see any. Has some something else come in since? There, there are a number of emails that have just come in. Yep. Ah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit. How do we want to, to do that? Do we want to, um, I did, to select someone, perhaps uh, well, anybody to read and uh, Indicate the person, the address, and the comment. What's going on? Watermark? I'm sorry? To the extent they're relating to the recall petition, should we reserve those for the discussion of the recall election? Um, I think that's fine. I think that would that would make good sense. I think that'll, as we're having that discussion, then bring those comments in and allow for that. Is that. Are other board members okay with that? Sure, that's fine. Okay. There may be some that are not related. Uh, I think there may be one or more that are not. Great. So I'm I'm not seeing them. So um, Anne, do do you want to uh, read some out? Right. I believe the one email that looks like it is unrelated. Uh, to the recall election that has just come in is a uh, suggestions from Timothy Kerwin uh, on, um, and it's titled Suggestions. Um, it says, put the speaker's name and title on a scroll as they present. Uh, I assume this would be Mark for, for perhaps for next time. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, let me just read verbatim. Put the speaker's name and title on a scroll as they present. Add the email address for public comment to the screen as a hot link. Will all licensed food and beverage businesses require reinspection before opening? Do we have the bandwidth to expedite this? The recall is late in the agenda. Of, well, it's all part of one email. The recall is late in the agenda. Personally, I hope it fails miserably. Just vote accordingly unless the issues arise to malfeasance or other legally documented offenses. Tim K, 48 Hamscombe Avenue, Reading, Massachusetts, um, 781-942-2360. Is that the only one that we have right now? Bob? Mark, I can, um, we, we discussed that, Emmy and I discussed that a little bit, but 
um, it will be a requirement to have the Board of Health reinspect any food establishment before it opens. Um, do we have the bandwidth? It depends on how whether they all open on the same day. That's that is an issue I raised as a concern. Um, but we really will have no choice but to do the best we can. Um, we we did discuss on Monday, and I don't know what's happened since. It's only Tuesday. Um, to have staff go out and start inspecting now, um, whether they're going to inspect the places that are now open or closed was being discussed. I don't know. Um, Gene, I don't know if you have anything on that, but it seemed like uh, not waiting till the last minute when things open were the best approach. Yeah, I can, I can respond to that a little bit. Um, across the board with all the staff, the question that we ask ourselves almost on a daily basis is what can we be doing now to use this time so that when things are back to whatever normal is or was the new normal um, that we've we've gotten ahead in some measure, and so with regard to the inspections, one of the things we've discussed was um, maybe we could start with the closed food um, the important work of making sure that things like um, food that needs to be disposed of has been um, that kind of routine um, inspection related activity can be done proactively now while they're closed. So that will be one less thing and it will make the inspection go quicker when they re reopen. It's that kind of thinking that we're, we're putting in place and um, starting tomorrow, that's what we will be implementing. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, I'm looking now, now I'm getting the emails. So I'm not seeing anything else that's not related to the recall petition. Is anyone else seeing something that, that I'm not? Okay, so why don't we hold those until we, we, we get to that uh, agenda item. Um, so we were gonna go on to the hearing, but the hearing's not called till eight o'clock and we're at 7.40. Um, would it be possible to do the community development updates now? Can we kind of do a swap for timing? Does that work? Um, and so, uh, Jean and Julie, can I hand the stage over to you? Sure. Fine with me. Great. You have the stage. <laughs> Do you want to start with the public hearing material? Do you have a presentation you want to put up, Julie? I do not. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The only document I provided was the, the written protocols for land use permitting. So, so do you want to start with that or do you want to start with hearings in general or? I say, Julie, for your benefit, since um, we never see each, see each other anymore, mm -hmm. um, yesterday, um, Mark and Ann and, and Ray and I had a discussion about, and this was one of the topics. And Niaris and Harrington will work to develop a single policy for all public hearings to the extent that's possible. So Ray knows full well that you folks with Chris Heap have really only worked on land use boards so far, but he, he, did, he couldn't think offhand why it wouldn't be possible to just expand that policy to all boards appointed by the select board and their public hearings, just so you know. Okay, thank you. So I don't know if you had a chance to review the document that I prepared, but Part of the reason that it took so long for it to come out was because we were kind of waiting to see what the state legislature would do. And I believe um, it was last Monday that they signed, that the governor finally signed the legislation. I, time is like totally strange concept now, but I think it was last week. So we worked, we, we were kind of like thinking about things and I was reaching out to applicants in the chairs of the different committees and commissions that are under the land use um, community development, you know, purview. And we, the legislation allows for, for both. It allows for the tolling of statutory timeframes, but also for towns to hold remote public hearings if we want to. So it's really a, a question of what the culture and the context and the priorities, I guess, and the feeling of the town is about how um, capable we are of holding public hearings that really um, include a robust amount of public participation um, that we feel comfortable you know, making progress on different applications that are before the boards. So I will say that um, at least the chair of the CBDC agrees with us 
holding off for now and seeing, you know, if it's a couple months, that might be okay. If this extends, you know, four or five or six months, maybe we revisit it. Um, because the, the public in-person component of our meetings is, is very critical and important to our process. So there are some ways we can kind of, you know, meet in the middle with applicants if we need to, if this extends longer than, than we think. But for now, the feeling I'm getting is that we should hold off on public hearings. Um, and I've reached out to all the applicants and Andrew reached out to the zoning board applicants and we haven't received any pushback to date from any of the applicants that are under at least those two commissions. Um, Conservation has had two meetings since we've been working from home um, because they, they were dealing with a slightly tighter statutory time frame than you know the zoning board and the planning board, um, community planning and development commission. So their tight time frame, you know, meant that when they had their last meeting and the legislation hadn't been passed yet, they needed to schedule another meeting within two weeks. And so that meeting was last week, it was the eighth, and they went ahead with that. They did easy business and continued a bunch of other more challenging hearings um, to May without discussion. So they were kind of working to get on the same policy or protocol that we were working on together so that we would all be kind of unified. Um, the CPDC had, was supposed to have a meeting last night. All the applicants willingly, without any questions really, continued to May 11th. The zoning board was the same. The applicants were perfectly amenable to it. And we let them know that, you know, for the May meetings, we will consider doing them remotely if we feel that we can get the kind of public participation that we should and that we're used to and that Reading really prioritizes. So that's kind of a discussion point, I guess. Um, and, you know, we can, I have some ideas about some things we can do to um, have that participation be better or, uh, at least more, maybe more inclusive um, and, and some ideas about how we can start processes for applicants if needed. Um, but I'll let you chime in on what your thoughts are. Great, thanks, Julie. So um, if I'm just kind of wrapping around for a second here, the notion would be to um, not hold public hearings at this time um, unless there's some extreme circumstance that, that really forces it forward in terms of um, the needs of a, a project or some other thing. But a lot of the deadlines, as far as the state's concerned, um, we're not getting backed into a corner on anything. Right. Right. So right. the thought would be to not hold public hearings until we can do them in person, assuming that we're able to do that over the course of the next few months. And if it lasts longer right. than that, we'd come back and say, let's let's figure out some other method of doing this. Right, and I mean, even we, we can discuss even trying to aim for remote meetings in May if we want to. We, we you know, we're able to, to, applicants were amenable to pushing off through April um, and they didn't express any issues with pushing off further if needed, but you know, it, because the legislation was just approved last week, it was kind of critical that we figured this out quickly for the meetings we had this week. Um, but we can work to have a different or sl slightly modified process for next month if needed, um, or you know, wait and see how long this goes, um, and and kind of take it like one week at a time. I guess things change every few days, so um, you know, hopefully we would know something soon, sooner rather than later about how we what we're dealing with. Um, there are, you know, some towns are like, I was looking to see like, what are other towns doing? Um, and some towns are just going ahead like business as usual. Some towns are dealing with the open hearings, but no new hearings. Like they're not starting new applications. Um, some towns are similar to us and are not entertaining it because like, we don't have any, um, you know, we. I guess depending on how you look at it and which side of the table you're on, there's there's pros and cons to doing things any way you want. Um, so from the town standpoint, where we really value public participation, we would want to make sure we're including everybody. And you know, but from a developer standpoint, if they're sitting on a piece of property or they, you know, really need to get certain things like permitted so that they can start construction as soon as life gets back to normal, um, you know, they they would view this maybe differently than we would. At, but you know, there's the staff. Um, opinion, there's the boarding committee opinion, there's the developer opinion, there's 
you know, the economy, there's a lot of things like baked into this. So there are different ways we can approach it. This was just something that I proposed because it seems like at least in Reading, the land use boards um, and the applicants that we have currently before us and even some future ones who I've spoken to um, are amenable to doing this. So, you know, I mean, that might not last forever but it's okay for now. So are there board comments on either uh, just the land use side of this as kind of piece one, but more broadly, um, assuming that if we, we think this is an appropriate process and waiting for land use, that we'd extend it to other boards and committees as well to uh, not have public hearings until there's communication. Carlo. I just have a question for Julie is uh, how many applicants do you have currently? And you mentioned about you know, maybe there's something you can close. Do you feel comfortable as we get into May that some of them could be closed or you wanna hold everybody off? So that's a good question. And there's a, there's like right now, the CPDC has four applicants who have submitted already. There are a couple of projects that we know about that we're planning on submitting in either May, June or July. And I've spoken to those developers and they're okay with waiting. Um, I have talked to them about meeting them in the middle. Like, so for example, the first night of a public hearing for a project usually is a lot of the development and the board asking questions. There isn't a lot of public participation usually that first night. Um, so that is something like if this extends a long time or if a developer is really anxious to get going that, that um, at least the CPDC chair is interested in entertaining that um, meeting in the middle kind of approach where we would start the hearing that first night to make some progress and then, you know, see where we are in a month or two and, and wait um, until we can be, be in person. Um, they, I will say with regards to closing things out, um, there isn't a very high comfort level with doing that remotely. So they, so one thing is if we started it remotely, we would want to make sure that like, applicants know that we're not gonna do the whole process remotely. There will be at least one opportunity for the public to be in the meeting room in person. Um, so that could, in theory, extend something out many, many, many months, um, depending on where this goes. Um, but I mean, so so it's like a, what I'm trying to impress upon you is that it's, it's in flux and it's kind of a, it's, there's a little bit of art and a little bit of science to it. So we, it's not this, this protocol is kind of like for right now, getting us to May and it can be revisited and rethought and, you know, it can be flexible. Um, I will say that I would caution that if we had a project that we felt like we want, like really needed to get going, that if we extend that offer to one applicant, we would want to make sure we do that for everyone. So um, just so we're being fair and above board, but I would say that the board should not do an entire public hearing remotely. Um, and that's the opinion that I've gotten from the chair of CPDC. And that's, I think that's a good opinion. Um, so. No, thank you. Is four, from your experience with the town, is four at this time of year uh, an average number, a high number, a low number? It's pretty average, I would say. Um, two of them have been ongoing for a long time. Uh, one of them, the applicant was the applicant's engineer was out of town since December, so they like literally the last time they were at CPDC was December, and they continued to April, like knowing that, you know. So that that was, and then there's been another one that was waiting to see if there's some zoning changes would pass at town meeting, and they may redesign their project. So that one's been continued for many many months. And that developer I spoke with yesterday, and he's totally fine with waiting a couple more months if needed. Um, and I, you know, or he may come in with a concept review. That's another thing that I that I, sorry to jump around, but the CPDC could also entertain like a concept review of something, um, which wouldn't require a, a legal ad or a notification to a butters because it would literally just be a concept and they would be providing initial feedback to an applicant so that they could at least get going during this period with some guidance on, on what the full submittal should look like. Um, so, but yeah, so four is, is pretty normal, I think. And a couple of them have been ongoing a long time. No, thank you. Yeah, the, the, and I understand what's going on, and it seems like you have a good handle on it. So, anything that we can do, it would be great. And it seems like everyone's on board with, you know, guidance and waiting till May, and then take it from there. Thank you. Any other board member questions or comments? 
I have a comment. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Julie, for coming up with solutions to this problem. Um, I know even with an average caseload, these processes of working through the CPDC and ZBA and the other conservation hearing processes usually are quite time consuming. So um, <clears throat> I think it's also wonderful that you were able to reach out to them personally. I know a lot of people are just getting emails. Oh, you're canceled. This is canceled. That is canceled. Um, and anybody who who sat in through the uh, board of uh, registrars meeting where attorney Miares was in the meeting and sort of giving examples about how difficult to do a good hearing it can often be. Um, I'm glad to hear, you know, your urging caution and um, your point about being um, consistent across the board in the issue of um, fairness is, is well taken. So thank you. Other board questions or comments? I, I see Aaron, I, I know you were, you were listening for a little bit. Any Anything you wanna add to the discussion? No, not right now. Okay, great. Um, so board members, I guess what we probably should think about here is at least a, a near-term policy. I think we would ask Ray uh, probably to work with Julie to put together a more formal policy about this. And also to allow that if there are exigent circumstances or some major uh, you know, obstacle or, or deadline of some sort that uh, there would be kind of a way to come back and, and see what we could do. Is the board comfortable with, with kind of giving that direction at this point? Yes. Yes, and I, I to the exigent circumstances, um, line of thinking, I would say if if exigent circumstances arise, I, I still would caution that while we are in the a state similar to where we are now, that it be done remotely in the case of exigent circumstances rather than convening gatherings of people. Yeah, I think that that should definitely be part of it. Carla, you had a comment? No, no, it sounds good. I... Oh, great. Uh, that's anything from your side? No, I think that's fine. Thanks. Okay, so uh, if this is what we're thinking for land use, are we thinking that this makes sense more broadly also, that we're, we're essentially saying um, public hearings um, should not take place, well, first of all, they, they can't take place with physical public, number one, but number two, that we wanna hold off on them um, at this time. Um, and we ask Ray to write up some language so that we could kind of have this be a consistent policy for public hearings. I think so. I think um, as long as this continues, uh, at least, you know, and it could change, but it looks like we're going to be in the situation at least through the early part of May. Yeah, I agree. Bob, do you have any, any comments? Um, no, I don't think so. I think Ray is anticipating, unless you said otherwise, to try to develop a uniform policy for all of your boards. And I know that uh, Julie and, uh, and Chris are still going back and forth to some degree on the land use boards, although you might have finally re reached a, a point of being complete. Um, we did, we okay, did. And then Ray was gonna take it from Chris when you reach that point and then just uh, punch it up to be something a little more generic, unless something came up tonight that the board wanted to go a different direction. So it sounds like he's going the right way. Great. Um, so I see we are at about 7.56. So and I also, Mark, Mark, if I could, um, we had asked Aaron just to give a kind of a business update. It's not technically on the agenda other than just under community development. So certainly Aaron could do that. Please, and for great. Aaron's benefit, um, just a little while ago, I, I've received some correspondence from Brad Jones that I've sent to you. Um, it appears that uh, MassDOT and National Grid will work this out and not have to pave Main Street twice, or at least we'll hope so. Thank you. So Aaron, to you please. So just wanted to briefly let the board know about this, uh, my updated business support letter, which I'm actually working on another version um, for tomorrow. Um, 
And I just want to let everyone know that that is available on the Town of Reading's website, um, which is the on the economic development page. It can be accessed multiple ways, including on the homepage of the town website under the economic development button. And on the left-hand side of the economic development page, it's called updated COVID-19 business support and resource letter. And there are many, many, many resources there along with summaries. So just wanted to let the board know what I've been up to for the last couple of weeks. Um, quickly in bulleted list here, it's also written out in my letter. Um, I've been participating in statewide weekly calls with Lieutenant Governor Polito, Secretary Keneally of the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Economic Development, Secretary Acosta, who's the, um, the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development. Those calls have been incredibly helpful. Um, they've been vital for receiving important information about available state and federal resources that are available for small businesses and employees. And I'm getting weekly updates kind of behind the scenes of what's happening. And I'm pro providing that information in this business letter as well. I'm also participating in region-wide weekly calls with Mass Hire Metro North Workforce Board um, to review state initiatives and services that are provided to employers and also to job seekers in the region. Uh, there are, believe it or not, uh, businesses that are hiring. And I think um, to also know that that resource is available um, as well. I've also been consistently communicating with Lisa Egan, who's the executive director of the Reading North Reading Chamber. And I've been participating in the Reading North Reading Chamber regional conference calls regarding business resources and making sure that our businesses in Reading um, are also getting information. Um, I've been participating in professional trainings and webinars through the Urban Land Institute and International Downtown Association, specifically to learn how real estate um, related sectors and downtown nonprofit organizations and municipalities are responding to economic development needs in and around our region and also nationwide and internationally, which is really interesting too. Canada has um, some really good examples through the International Downtown Association. Um, and I'm really thinking forward about how we might be able to reopen in the future and what that might look like for betting. And I'm really hopeful, even though this is a really horrible time, um, but I do think that we were on the right track to be successful as the town. I think that we'll continue to do so and the things that we had planned um, it will be something that we can pick back up again, um, just with a little bit of a twist and being mindful about um, what reopening may look like for us. Um, it'll be slow, um, but I think generally I'm, I'm pretty positive that we'll be able to come together and um, help each other move forward. Um, I've also been individually reaching out to businesses. I've touched over 100 businesses, which has been great. Um, and I'm providing additional information resources that may be needed, and I'm following up with those businesses. Um, I'm still working down my list. I haven't touched everyone by any means, um, but I am reaching out. So um, anyone who's listening who's a business who needs help or resources, I'm here and available and happy to talk to people. And I'm also updating the website in collaboration with other town departments. So that's my quick update, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Erin. Is there anything that uh, you'd want to point out on the website? Would it help to put that up or just leave it for now? Yeah, I, so I would just point people to my letter because that's the most updated resource. And then I've also pulled out a couple of um, big things like the PPP loan program and unemployment information. I've actually, oh, thank you for that. Um, so updated on the left-hand side, the buttons there, that's my business resource letter. Thanks, Mark. Um, that gets updated when I know more information, when there's been an update with state or federal resources or information like that, or local in case of um, the select board making decisions too. Um, there's a business owner's guide to the CARES Act, the payment protection program, loan program information, the Small Business Administration Express. So those are all the SBA programs there. And I think the most important one for this week is that there's actually updated information about unemployment applications um, and assistance information. Mark, if you click on that um, and scroll down just a little bit, I know a lot of people were um, needing unemployment um, benefits. What has changed is that there's new information regarding gig 
economy workers or um, 1099 employees and that kind of information. Um, there's additional uh, unemployment benefits through the CARES Act. And so I provided that information and link up at the top there. And for anyone who needs to apply um, for unemployment benefits, I have the application location there and um, the Department of Unemployment Assistance is holding daily virtual town halls in multiple languages. So I think that's important. Um, if you need help with how do I change my password or how do I actually fill out the application form, um, those virtual town halls, I've listened in on a few and they've been incredibly helpful. Um, so I would say if you need help, that that's um, in addition to website online application, um, those virtual town halls are by phone call um, or by webinar. It's all at the same time. Um, and that's been incredibly helpful. That's great. Thank you, board members. Any questions or comments? Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Thank you. All right, let me go back here. So um, it's now just after eight o'clock. So I think what we wanna do is, uh, this is a continuation of the public hearing on, on parking, correct? So we don't actually need a motion to open. Correct. Okay, so uh, uh, what we just discussed in terms of public hearing policies, <laughs> um, I think we feel, I feel, and I'll let the board share their comments as well, that the discussion on, on parking needs to be a very public process and we need to have a lot of participation and we don't have a good mechanism for that yet. Um, I think the discussion we just had really summarizes that we're best not having hearings unless there's something that has incredible circumstance that requires us to do it. Um, so what I would suggest is that um, we would let this hearing lapse um, we would, um, as we are going to be talking further about parking and we're more able to have a public process, we would open a new hearing to have that discussion. Um, and the only question I guess I would ask before moving to that is to ask uh, Julie, Aaron, Jean, is there anything that is you know, direly required right now on, on parking that should be discussed or are we in a position to kind of uh, let this hearing lapse? I can answer that. Um, I think that you're in a position to let it lapse. I think, though, that given the implementation matrix that I put forth um, for the March meeting that didn't happen or, or was continued or whatever, um, right. that it would be good, at, like if you're if we're thinking still about January 2021, um, we will need some decisions to be made in September, but I don't think that anything necessarily needs to happen between now and then. Um, you know, if like, like the other hearings I talked about, if this state of emergency continues for many, many months, we might consider starting it or restarting it remotely at some point in July or August, if the goal remains to do something by January 2021 at this point. So it's like like everything kind of in flux, I think. Got it. Board member comments, Ann? No comment. Oh, sorry, I, I saw the microphone go. Any other comments from, from board members? Any thoughts on this? No, all good. Um, procedurally, how do we let a, a hearing lapse? Do we just say there are no comments and, and close it? Um, you don't have to do anything. Ah, just move, yeah. move to the next agenda item. You don't <laughs> have to close it. Oh, okay. No, you just take no action. I, I can make a suggestion about that real quick, um, which is something that we'll do for the land use boards. Like, so if and when the hearings, well, when the hearings are held, whether remotely or in person, we, we our plan is to re-advertise and let abutters know. Like, so if they've been waiting or thinking we're not doing things until town hall opens and we decide to do it early, or if so many months go by, they get like re-notified that, that it's starting up again. So that's something we could do with downtown parking as well. I would suggest it. Great, great. That would be great. Okay, thank you. So we, we, we've let that happen. Um, so uh, back, uh, Jean, Julie, uh, any updates related to MassDOT and the road diet uh, or any other items that you guys may want to update us on? I think Aaron has that update for us. Ah, sorry. Yes, I do. 
so I'm not sure how to best send um, this information or links to this information. Maybe I can send it to you, Mark, and you might be able to get out to everyone. Bob, it's the same uh, links that I sent earlier today in my email to you and Jean. Um, so anyway, I will start here. Um, the MassDOT project, the MassDOT um, road diet trial is moving forward as planned. There is a project fact sheet um, and information that's available on the MassDOT project website um, that I just sent to Mark that I hope um, we'll be able to get out. Um, that project website is also located on the Town of Reading web uh, site. On the home page, there's a button at the bottom left called Main Street Paving, and that is where you will be able to find the MassDOT project website, which MassDOT, again, it's the state project. There's also an open house presentation that was just posted on April 10th from Andy Paul, who had presented at, um, Andy Paul works for MassDOT, he's an engineer with, on this project, and um, he has provided a slide explains the project. I think that's a really helpful piece of information. Um, there is the MassDOT project is also looking for public comment um, on any changes or um, I should say the, the change in paint that you'll see in a couple of weeks, um, what's working, what's not at specific locations. Um, there is an interactive mapping tool to be able for the public to be able to submit a comment uh, to the project team. And I think that's actually a really interesting and fun tool. You can put in your address and tell the team what you're seeing and what you want. Um, and that's really helpful information on the ground information to be able to give to the project team. You can also reach out directly to the project team, route uh, 28 pilot at dot.state.ma.us. And again, we can get that information um, out to everyone. Uh, let's see. In general, the project team is seeking public feedback. Um, please know that we've talked about lane reductions, um, but the roadway layout will actually vary along the corridor. There are plans for um, specific and particular sections of the road layout that are also available on the mass.project page. And um, that's really helpful information. And I know that there were some questions regarding um, bike lanes and that kind of thing. And what I wanted to say was regarding bike safety, there are different levels of risk um, that different bike riders are willing to take. And MassDOT calls this a level of comfort, Main Street Route 128 or 28 is currently a really high stress situation where maybe advanced riders or confident riders might take a risk and ride on the roadway. Um, but with roadway improvements, such as designing a roadway to slow down car speeds or having pavement markers um, that visually indicate space for bikers, these physical changes reduce stress and risk to cyclists. So even though the central goal of this project is about vehicular safety, a reduction in car speeds and severity of crashes is the central goal, but that will also be advantageous for all roadway users, including pedestrians, cars, and bikes. Um, so I did want to echo um, or share that information. So again, the main goal of the project is to reduce the number of car crashes and severity of crashes along this heavily traveled corridor. And through this project, um, the state is testing new infrastructure elements, really changing paint locations in the existing roadway with the slow down vehicle speeds and simplified left turns. Um, Thank you, Mark. This is um, the project website here. And scroll down. This YouTube video is new. This is a full presentation that was uh, given at um, the Reading Library um, and a business meeting. It was modified after that business meeting. Um, the plans had changed um, to actually take away the bike markings in the shoulder, um, that the five foot shoulder that's indicated 
there still will be a five foot shoulder that bikers can bike in. Um, at this point, the project team has taken away that um, bike symbol um, out of the plans at this time due to feedback um, received at the business meeting. Um, so anyway, that's the road diet um, video there. And Mark, if you scroll down a little bit more about, you can contact the project team directly with contact information down at the way bottom, but what, yeah, the about the route uh, 28 resurfing and road diet. This is really helpful information here. It's general project information, project area with a map, the pilot lane configuration changes, the project schedule, public outreach and involvement, and again, more contact information. Um, obviously, because of our limitations here and seeing people physically, um, we can't have physical meetings with lots of people. Um, that presentation that I just pointed out is really meant to take the place of that uh, March 24th big open house that we were trying to plan. Um, and we have some really cool um, new mapping tools that MassDOT is actually trying out on our project here um, by working behind the scenes. So there is um, a mapping tool that I'd like to kind of get to keep going down to the down. schedule. A little bit. Yeah. Right there. So this is really awesome. Um, the project team really wants to hear from you. And the way to be able to do that, there are several ways of being able to engage with the project team a little more indirectly, but also specifically um, is this mapping tool where you can enter your address, whatever the address might be. So I don't know, 210 Main Street, something. Street, put in Reading, Mass, and then search. And you can zoom in just a little bit, or a little bit more, there you go. And what we're seeing here is the proposed layout at that particular location. And if you have a comment about that new paint on the roadway, you can enter your comment below in the next comment box at number two and scroll down a little bit on the website and Mark, you can write test or whatever you wanna put in there um, so we can tell the project team that we're actually testing this when they get their comment and I'll review them on Thursday. And then in number three, select any of the following topics that apply to your comment. You can select up to three. and continue. And then this is some more information, put in your zip code and you can, and your last name is required. Do you have specific questions or concerns? And then continue. And again, it's just some information here your name, your email address of the project team. If you'd like the project team to come back to you, you can uncheck subscribe to future updates on this project, or you can sign up for future updates on the project and continue. So I'm meeting with the MassDOT team on a weekly basis on Thursdays, and we are consistently reviewing information received by the public and consistently coordinating um, our communications. But I wanted to point out this tool that's Really awesome. I hope people use this. Um, it's a way to be able to specifically click on a specific intersection. Um, you can let the MassDOT team know that you were in a crash there 10 years ago, or, you know, or this works really well, for example, or, you know, that kind of level of information is really helpful for the team as they move forward and evaluating. It's one mechanism that the, the team is using to evaluate the project. Um, so there it is. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Um, Aaron, could you just comment very briefly on the latest information that we have on when things are going to happen and where, like this week and next week, that, that kind of immediate sort of stuff? Yeah, sure. Let me see. I know that there are signs that are already out 
And I know milling and paving is starting, I think this week um, at night is my understanding. And yeah, I have an update. As much information. They, they just asked for permission to work during the day instead of night. Oh, thanks. So I gave them permission with the police uh, chief's approval uh, as long as the state of emergency continues. Thank you, um, so they'll be working during the day on both north and south sections. And I also just got clarification. Um, it's great having this real time information. Our town engineer confirmed the uh, gas line work on the northern section is very small. It's uh, really just at one intersection. Great. Um, they, they're going to start working this week, weather permitting. Okay, so both north and south sides. Right. Yes. In daytime. Right. Great. Okay. So th this uh, came upon us kind of quickly. Um, <laughs> I, I think maybe in, in, in COVID-19 time, it was particularly quickly. So um, you know, just to be aware. And if people have um, questions or concerns, the best way, Aaron, is to go to that website and um, send information in about their concern. Yeah. So um, is there a way to post the links? Maybe I can do that. Um, for the for everyone with your permission sure um you can send it inside here i may be able to post it can everyone see that so this is the route 28 pilot uh, email address or is there something else you sent all right, that is to everyone. Here's the project fact sheet. Um, I have the MassDOT project website. That's the link there. I have the open house presentation by Andy Paul. That's the link to the presentation, the link to the interactive mapping tool. And um, for a direct email to the project team with questions or comments, I've also provided that email address below as well. Is this all in the... I'm not able to copy it, unfortunately. That's okay. Everyone just got um, all of those links, I think, through the Zoom group chat. And again, all that information is available on the Town of Reading website on the homepage under the Main Street Paving Project button. They can get to this website, and this MassDOT website has all of that contact information. Um, there's the project page. Can people watching at home see the chat? No. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't believe so. No, they can't. Okay. Um, I think if you can, um, Aaron, if you can email, uh, just send me a quick email with sure. that information, then I can do a copy paste and I'll put it into a slide and then I can put that up on the screen. Sure. I, I know it's clunky, but <laughs> no worries. Apologies for not having this done ahead. Um, Um, if I may, there, were, there was a post of this on the Town of Reading Facebook page today. Very helpful. But a lot of anxious people and questions. And I was wondering whether you might want to put a link directly to this really neat opportunity for people to provide specific feedback yes. on the Town of Reading Facebook page. I think that would make a lot of people happy. Or no problem. Thank you. Erin, I have a question for you. Um, one of the issues that was raised was that was concern about traffic going out into um, neighboring areas or streets um, as people try and avoid 28 with this change. And part of the trial was going to be um, a study to see how neighboring streets were affected with traffic obviously being significantly less right now and the summer generally having less traffic. Do you know what the plan is? Um, I, I, Mark and I, or sorry, uh, Bob and I spoke earlier today about this, um, but for the rest of the board's information, um, if you could provide any information or you, Bob, about how that study will be conducted so that we'll have accurate information on how surrounding areas are affected. Yeah, I'm, uh, that's something that the project team is still looking into right now, but you know, MassDOT is looking at a variety of projects, not just ours. 
and they need to be consistent across the state. And so that is something that they're currently working on to reevaluate and look at their measurement tools. So I can get back to you um, once I learn more information about how they're going to do that. That'd be great, thank you. See, there actually are a few questions um, coming in in, in the uh, public discussion here um, from, from Bob Holmes. Um, why did DOT take out the bike markings? Is it a bike lane or not? Yeah, so um, from my understanding, from feedback that was received at the business meeting, um, it is a five foot shoulder that bikes can use. <coughs> Um, it is not currently, there were markings with a bike symbol in that shoulder um, that were proposed. And from that, um, from a response, from responses back from that business meeting, um, it was decided after that, that bike marking would be removed um, for now. Um, I think that there's still an opportunity and MassDOT team is still changing its markings um, because we're still, the project team is still receiving public comment. Um, so if one way or another, uh, if you have an opinion on having bike lanes or not, that is um, something that the team wants to hear. But more importantly, the focus of this project is really about vehicular safety and slowing cars down and decreasing um, the intensity of crashes. And that's, that's actually really important to highlight that that's the central goal of Gang um, or complete streets. It, this project is really about vehicular safety. Um, there's a message from Mike Monahan, Bancroft Avenue. Why are they reducing the number of lanes for traffic on Route 28 with no input or hearings from the public? Input into a website is not sufficient mechanism for public input, in my opinion. I'm very opposed to anything that makes traffic worse on Route 28. Not much, not much comment from staff. It's really a state project. It um, is. The public needs to let the state know what their feelings are. Mm -hmm. And we did have a fairly robust public outreach effort um, that was impacted by what we're going through right now. Yeah. Uh, there's another note here from Bobby Botticelli, um, Colonial Manor Realty. I don't have the exact address here. Um, I attended the first non-publicized road diet meeting. There were only a small handful of abutters in attendance as it was not advertised. We were assured that nothing would happen until there was a public hearing. Since public hearing has not taken place, I asked this project be on hold. Also, it was told to us that the intent for bikers was not for them to use bike lanes. That's why they're not using bike signs. Folks, did I miss any other comments on this? I think those are the three that I saw. Anybody else see one? Nope. There is a second email from Mike Monahan. Um, he did, or at 8.14, uh, Route 28 traffic for cars is already awful. Why make it worse with fewer lanes? Mike Monahan, Bancroft Avenue. So it, it sounds like the, the, the right activity now is to send our concerns um, through that website and through the email addresses that we're going to publicize here to let people know of the concerns. Um, there was going to be that all day meeting at Staples that was in March and that disappeared because of the COVID-19 situation. Um, and, you know, that would have been an, an opportunity, but we don't have it. So I guess we, we need to send information in. The information that would have been presented at that meeting is now in the form of a YouTube uh, video that can be accessed through the MassDOT page as well as the Town of Reading homepage. And I should add for the public that might just be tuning in, um, this is a upwards of $7 million repaving project. It's federal funds. And this trial road diet was said early on as to be an absolute requirement of that funding. So it is not optional. It is not something that can be delayed. In order for the state to receive the funds to do the project, they must do this. 
but it is a trial road diet. It is not a road diet decision. I do want to echo that. That's why there are multiple ways of being, in a, being able to provide information and provide feedback. And I just got a note from Phil Rushworth. RCTV has posted the MassDOT video on Facebook and airing it on the public access channel. Thank you. Right. So. Mark, can I add something? Please, Carl. I think what um, Aaron has stated about public input was clear when the bike lanes kind of are not happening as a you know, bike lane. It's now a shoulder where bikes can be on. So that was due to public input, correct, Aaron? Correct. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of the misconception early on that this was the town of Reading's doing and where Bob just said that, you know, it's the state and it's tied to money. I'm hoping the public has a better understanding that uh, the town of Reading did not push for this and we have no choice, but it, again, it's a trial. It's nothing permanent. And the more feedback that we give, as some residents and businesses have done in the past, uh, people seem to be listening. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Carl. One question that did come up is that because it's a trial and they're determining the trial period, um, doing it over the summer, I know we reflected was a concern because it didn't reflect all the school traffic and activities situation that we're in clearly there's not nearly the usual traffic going on on that road if it turns out they evaluate in the next you know in may and june that may not be an accurate reflection at all of what's going on um is there a way my, to give them feedback on that it's my understanding that the project team has already evaluated MassDOT has evaluated this corridor over time uh significantly in the past and i think that they'll be looking back at those numbers when we were all working and doing our regular things. Um, and I anticipate that there, you know, obviously will have to be some changes in the way that they look at their um, data moving forward with the trial itself because we're not experiencing our regular activities. Again, I don't know what that standard will look like yet. Um, and MassDOT is working through that right now. Got it. Do we know when the trial is slated to run until and then an evaluation point takes place? I think it was September. September. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, it may be that we want to uh, talk with them about how they're going to evaluate the new configuration, um, you know, based on low traffic data. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you, guys. Was there anything else that you folks wanted to bring up? in terms of community development updates? No, all good? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Next you. on the agenda uh, is uh, Human Rights Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, Anne, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Certainly, I'm, I'm happy to speak now. Um, since it looks like Ray and Alan are waiting in the wing, I didn't know if you would prefer to defer the ad hoc committee converse, conversation until after we discuss town meeting and the recall. Um, it also might be appropriate to talk about ad hoc committee close to when we're discussing liaison assignments to, to the extent another member of the board is interested in being part of that work. It might be worth thinking about in the context of all other liaison assignments that we have. But I'm happy Definitely. to come now depending on folks' preference uh, but being mindful of everyone's time and uh, Ray and Alan's as well. I'm fine with that. What do the other members think? I'm fine with that. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. It's fine. All right. So let's move on to uh, town meeting discussion. Um, so as uh, so Ray, come on in. Alan, if you could join also, I uh, would appreciate that. All right. Hello. Alan, are you able to, to join as well? Yes, I'm here. Great. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd uh, just give a, a quick overview kind of, of, of where we are, and then we can we can talk about it from there. So, uh, you know, Alan Foles, the town moderator, Bubba Lesher, town manager, sent an update to town meeting members about two weeks ago, highlighting expected changes needed in both the date and perhaps the format of town meeting this year. 
Given the state of emergency requirements prohibiting large public gatherings and to maintain social distancing, the board needs to vote tonight to change the date of town meeting. There have been some offline discussions uh, with the moderator and town manager to think of some options to share with the full board for discussion and then decision. Uh, the idea we'd like to put on the table for discussion is that we postpone town meeting until June 15th and then reevaluate this date at the board's last meeting in May, which would be May 27th, to see if there's a way to have a safe meeting. We have an option to not meet before the end of the fiscal year, the end of the fiscal year being June 30th, and just use a 1 12th of the year's budget, which would allow us not to have to meet, I guess, until mid-July, basically. Um, there are some preferences to only do this if absolutely necessary. What I thought I would do is ask Bob if you'd comment on that and then uh, hand it over to Alan and ask if you'd share your, your thoughts on changing the date and how we might approach this. So Bob, you wanna grab it, please? Certainly, thank you. Um, <clears throat> finance is starting to take a significant place in some of the weekly emergency state calls that I'm on, especially as we approach the end of the year. And I'll just say uh, everyone agrees that it would be uh, better to have a budget approved in June because otherwise we're in uncharted territory. No matter what the legislation may attempt to do and help us, it's not gonna be the same as passing a budget. Uh, there could be some unforeseen um, obstacles um, should a community rely on the one. Uh, Reading typically makes a semi-annual pension contribution in the month of July. Um, we believe that that would be exempted from the one twelfth. In other words, in addition to the one twelfth spending, um, as would uh, debt payments. Um, but again, the legislation has been very good so far. It has not gone into enormous depth on finance. And it's clear that as we get closer to June, if it's not going to be possible to have town meetings, there will be further legislation. But where there isn't any right now, it's, it's really incumbent on all of us to plan uh, on a November town meeting. And I am a little bit concerned that a 112th budget um, could be spending too much money depending on what the revenue picture of the state looks like. Uh, you said, when you said November town meeting, did you mean June town meeting? Oh, uh, sorry, June town, yeah, June town meeting, sorry. Yeah. Alan, can I ask you to chime in here, please? Sure. Well, as Mark said, the three of us have uh, met and developed a, a very loose plan that we feel will at least get us through the annual town meeting. Looked at thinking of various locations, maybe just to, to be able to spread out more, cutting down the number of Warren articles to make the meeting shorter, knowing full well that uh, these plans have to be, may have to be altered again, may take different directions as we get closer to a new meeting date. A lot of details still need to be worked out, and we've got a little time for that. For now, it seems the safest way to to proceed under the circumstances is to delay the meeting and give us more time to see what's happening so we can conduct the town's business. Our plan has some flexibility. We've developed a series of directions that we can take depending on the circumstances of the next month or two months. I think Mark is actually going to make a presentation to, uh, to, to delay the meeting to like June 15th. Is that what we thought of? Yeah, we had talked about somewhere uh, early in that week um, to do it. And, and um, if I could just add one of the the issues for the select board is that we we can we need to vote a, a delay. Um, we can vote an additional delay down the road so that if we set ourselves with a date to kind of review this decision, we can come back to it. And also the town moderator has some some flexibility in terms of, of adjusting uh, the date also. Um, and, and that may continue to change as, as legislation changes also. I, I will point out that this is something maybe Ray can chime in on, but our town meeting um, votes do not become effective until seven days after the meeting ends. So it does give us an effective date of June 23rd that we have to finish our business. There is a, a way of having some kind of an emergency preamble on the front, so maybe that would overcome that. But right now, we have to get the uh, at least the budget passed by June 23rd to make that June 30th date. So board members, do you have questions or comments on, on this idea or, or suggestions uh, to improve it. I have a question, Mark. Um, has the state made any um, changes or accommodations for reaching quorum for town meeting? I guess I can answer that. 
um, an early draft version of the legislation did have that language in there, um, but it did not make the final version that was passed. Um, there were some concerns with uh, a, a local select board having an ability to lower a quorum to a very low number um, for either um, open or representative town meetings. That doesn't mean it won't come back in the future depending on circumstances. I think we can expect additional municipal legislation potentially impacting town meeting, including uh, the opportunity potentially for virtual town meeting. Um, and I've mentioned to um, Mark and Bob previously, it's certainly my strong preference that we not convene any large gatherings of people while it while there is such a um, great public health threat going on. So to the extent we have the opportunity for um, virtual town meeting, to the extent we could um, provide some opportunity for either technical assistance for people who don't have access to the technology or some, some limited in-person participation for people who aren't comfortable with the technology, that would be my preference. My, my preference would be June, you know, prior to the end of the fiscal year, but with opportunity for virtual participation um, as the, the public health of our residents and town meeting members, some, many of whom are likely um, individuals who could be at risk um, should they say um, they the other The other piece of information that is current as of today is that there was a consensus revenue hearing at the state level um, and it seems like state the state budget could um, as some towns are going to be doing um, go to a, a 1 12th um, per month until the legislature is able to meet again in person which could happen after the um, end of this fiscal year and um, expected revenues are way way down of course Other board questions, comments, or ideas? Are folks comfortable with this notion of, of, of setting a date, you know, uh, let's say uh, of June 15th, um, and then uh, revisit it at the last May town meeting, excuse me, last May select board meeting, which I think would be the 27th of May? Mark, I have a logistical question. Uh, I really like Anne's idea of having it be virtual to the extent that we can do that um, with as many town meeting members as possible. Bob, does that give you and the staff and RCTV enough? Does that give this meeting at the end of May with two weeks notice give you enough time to arrange those technical details for that many members? Um, we discussed that today, and I, I obviously can't speak for Phil and RCTV, but I think it should. Um, Mark was discussing the idea of, of putting together a uh, few people, one from schools, town, technology, and, and RCTV to work on this, and to get started in the next two weeks. And, and to really explore what what's possible, what, what's doable, yep. um, anywhere from fully virtual, you know, possibly there's some kind of a hybrid model maybe even using multiple rooms uh, in a location where people could have distance. Um, there are a lot of logistics. Um, can't even really fathom what they are yet, but we probably should start on it fairly soon. <laughs> but you know, the notion of um, roll call voting for 192 people from multiple articles sounds kind of daunting. Um, but I think you know we'll, we're going to have to look at it. I guess the only good news out of it is there are 350 other communities that are facing pretty much the same situation, and hopefully we don't end up with 351 different solutions. Mark, Carla, is there uh, is that enough time for the warrant to be prepared? So uh, the warrant actually is it prepared at this point already? Um, the it. warrant. The warrant report is done and posted online, uh, but the superintendent and I are working on budgets and may certainly want to make some suggested revisions once we have a better picture of the state revenue. And I mentioned to the board, I think it was last week, um, I'd like to make revisions and have pretty much done that on the water sewer. 
uh, to not require rate increases for next year. So there will be some changes. The articles themselves, aside from the budget, um, are, are all set. The um, article for the current year's budget certainly will change um, over the next few months. So we're generally in good shape there. One of the thoughts, uh, Bob had put together the notion of um, a one day town meeting and trying to see what absolutely has to be passed, what absolutely has to happen. And maybe a possibility is that a lot of the uh, presentations that are made, um, not that they'd be uh, official town meeting presentations, but they could be recorded and shared with town meeting members and the entire community in advance. So, you know, perhaps around that end of May timeframe so that people could um, see them in advance, ask some questions in advance with the goal of, of resolving as many questions as we could before, you know, we have to, I don't want to say sit down together, but gather in whatever form that's going to be. Any, any thoughts that does the idea of, of that uh, kind of June 15th date and then review it at the end of May, does that sound reasonable? I think with the proviso that there's some kind of committee that's charged with exploring uh, options and we're not flat-footed on, on May 30th trying to figure out what to do on the 15th of June. Yeah, I agree with Ann that, um, you know, we're gonna, I think it was, yeah, I apologize. I think we're gonna see a, a quorum issue And I can think of at least one town meeting member with absolutely no technology, no smartphone, no computer. You probably might know him. I spoke <laughs> so. to him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I think virtual would be great. I know for some town meeting members, that's going to be a challenge. Yeah, so there may be, if we think of a hybrid structure, and again, this isn't at all thought through, so sorry, spitballing, but there might be an opportunity in virtual to allow for some people to participate by telephone to have RCTV broadcast, sorry, Phil, haven't talked to Phil about it yet. <laughs> have RCTV kind of broadcasting and the ability for town meeting members to, um, some to call in, some to participate on internet and possibly even some in, in separated rooms. Um, again, not well thought through yet, just ideas. As you're talking about it, I'm thinking about there is, um, you know, uh, networking capabilities throughout the high school. There's a lot of rooms and um, then there's town hall and there's a lot of rooms and there's the Pleasant Street Center. I don't, I don't, it could be, could be possible. I'd like to use the football field with the snack <laughs> shop open. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it should be nice. Instead of um, Reading Town Day, we're going to have town meeting. <laughs> Honestly, in the football stadium, if it's nice weather, there's a lot of room there. And how is the good sound system? Okay. Just to chime in, there has been one town that did have an outdoor meeting, town of Southwick. And, and how did that go, Alan? Uh, <laughs> first time through. <laughs> it was snowed out the first oh, well. time. The first, uh, yeah, yeah, it did. It got snowed out the first yeah. Right. Um, would it make sense to, um, I have um, a motion written down. And let me see to bring it forward here. Oops. You guys seeing a motion? Yes. Yes. Uh, Carlo, could I ask you to, to read the motion? Sure. Move that the select board postpone annual town meeting from April 27, 2020 to June 15, 2020 due to the COVID-19 state of emergency. Move also that the board will revisit, revisit this decision at a late May select board meeting in order to determine the safety of conducting town meeting on June 15, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Before I jump too far, Ray, is, does this look all right as written? Um, I just have one point that I think ought to be clarified, and that is uh, it says the board will revisit this decision at a late select board meeting, which suggests that, um, th that you might revise it, which obviously that's what you're contemplating. 
Right. Well, I assume that if you're going to revise it, you will only revise it to make it later. Yes, I would agree. Um, um, to, so, um, um, so that beautiful, beautiful. Very good. And, um, and as a comment on your prior discussion, um, there is currently pending legislation that would authorize representative town meetings to be conducted virtually. That legislation, at least the version I have seen of it, only applies to representative town meetings. Um, and it's quite detailed, um, but it hasn't been passed yet. And um, so everybody should just be a little cautious that, that while we have, um, the bill has a lot of support from towns that have representative town meetings. Um, we don't know for sure that we will even have the authority to do it. True. Okay, so if we don't have authority to do it, <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, we will be delaying further, right? Be the if we also ask um, that we can't do it safely. Safely. Right. So yeah, the, you know, I think a lot of people are assuming that at some point the emergency situation will be lifted. Um, that we will continue to refer to it as an emergency, but it um, will um, uh, perhaps allow for larger groups or, or or whatever. We don't really know what that looks like and. Um, and I we shouldn't speculate too much. I think it's just wise to say, we'll answer, we'll, we'll take another look at this at the end of May and see where we are. Okay, so we, we have a motion, a second, any, and uh, can we accept these as friendly amendments? That's all right with everybody? Sure. Okay, so any further comments on, on this before we take a vote? I'm just wondering, does it contemplate, does the determine the safety of conducting town meeting on June 15th, 2020 contemplate the manner of, of conducting it? You know, it, would we be discussing whether to hold it virtually at that time, if we could, or um, is that something actually that the that a subcommittee, as you'd mentioned earlier, might be, be working on in, in advance of that late May meeting? Um, could we, could we change the words to say to determine the ability to conduct town meeting safely on June 15th? In other words, the ability meaning perhaps there's legislation and a subcommittee that can work together to figure out how to do it if virtually is the choice or if other things change. Does, does that address your concern enough or, or, or not so? I think, I think it's probably even fine as is. I was just looking for a little additional clarity, but basically we're going to be looking at discussing at the end of May where we are and if it's safe to, if it's safe um, and in what manner or it could be safe. Um, I think that's, that works, that, that modification works, Mark. I didn't read it carefully. I pressed the go button. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So other than spacing. Yeah, I think that's good. That's good. Acceptable by all. Any last discussions? Very good. I'll fix the spacing. Okay. Let's take a vote. Uh, so we'll go roll call. Vanessa? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. And Mark? Yes. So we're 5 0. Okay. Um, go to the agenda. Okay. Next on the agenda is a discussion of the recall election. 
Um, obviously, we, I've asked that Ray uh, join us for, for the discussion here. Um, I have a little bit of commentary to, I think- Mark, this... I'd like to recuse myself this time. Can someone please inform me when the topic has ended? Absolutely, we'll do. And can I ask you to be the, uh, the person to contact her? Great. Okay, so we are, we are four at the moment. Okay, so discussing the, the recall election. So a uh, question for the board, for the four of us. We have a number of comments on this topic that are, are in abeyance. Um, we haven't discussed it ourselves yet. Is the preference to have us discuss it and then go through the comments or the reverse order to accept the comments and then discuss it? I think if, if people didn't have a preference, I think we would discuss it and then accept the comments. What are your thoughts? This is unprecedented. I, I'm really not sure which way we need to go on this. Anne? <laughs> we can do a little bit of both. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm afraid we start, if we start at one approach, we're going to end up doing both approaches because I, I, I think it's going to be hard to separate the items. Um, I think we might be able to have our discussion of before we take a vote, um, take a look at the, at the comments um, that have come in. And then we could continue discussion and then take a vote. Does that does that make sense? And yeah. no doubt when we when we start our own discussion, more comments will come in. So we could read what we've received to date, to date, discuss, then go back to additional comments that came in during the course of our discussion, or we could just take all the discussion. I think I'd be inclined to have our discussion first, um, unless someone really objects to that. Oh. No? Okay. All right. So um, I, I sketched out a couple of thoughts here that I thought would be worthwhile to have um, as a little bit of a frame. Um, so there have been some updates from the state on already called elections that focus on delaying the dates for public safety reasons. In order to have this special election, we need to assure a safe campaign process, which would mean gathering of signatures, the ability to meet people and campaigning as well as a safe election process for both voters and workers. With the pandemic, I don't believe we're able to do this at this time. If we set a date now, it's not clear that the board could even change this date barring special legislation from the state. So in other words, if we set a date and it turned out to be in the midst of a pandemic, state of emergency, whatever, we may have essentially boxed, our, boxed ourselves in and unwittingly set a date that um, actually confounds the process and leads to an unsafe process. Um, they could force residents to risk their safety in order to exercise their right to vote. I personally am not comfortable forcing people to make that decision. If we do not set a date yet, but set up guidelines for when we will set a date, that seems to me to be a reasonable approach, at least to have a discussion about it. The state is working on guidelines for elections. Hopefully they'll be working on some legislation over the next several weeks at least possibly. Um, in addition, we also have the situation where the registrars need to have a public hearing to confirm signatures, and it needs to be in person to handle the required logistics. Um, the registrars did discuss this. Um, we don't have anything formal back from them, but they had a discussion and um, the logistics seemed daunting to put it mildly. So per our discussion before about hearings, this would need to wait for some changes in, in the state of emergency that we can't put a date on quite yet. So what I am gonna suggest is that we revisit this issue, specifically not setting a date at this time until our last meeting in May, just as we've suggested for town meeting. Should the situation change before then in terms of state of emergency and other things, um, perhaps as measured by the reopening of the schools, we could revisit that sooner. So I'm, I'm just kind of putting that on the table and would ask the board to, to have some discussion their thoughts about that. Mark, we had a conversation about this yesterday, but I just wanted to provide a couple points of clarification. The legislation that previously passed with regard to town elections um, indicated that if you were scheduling an election before May 30th, you could delay it until June 30th, and it could not and would not apply to a recall election that we would call. 
Um, it also, that legislation allowed, I believe allowed for some mail-in ballots um, that there is legislation pending or, or, or being considered with respect to um, mail-in ballots for the remainder of elections uh, this calendar year, but where that goes, we don't know. Um, and I think it would be, I, the, the other thing we discussed with Ray is um, not necessarily tying it to the state of emergency um, as we don't, this, we'd have no idea when that will be lifted. And we there are also a lot of different measures um, in terms of the severity of the emergency that we can, that is going to be evaluated on a ongoing basis, but that um, revisiting this issue at um, the same time that we look at town meeting seems sensible in that I think uh, the same kind of health and safety issues that um, make me really want to, to look at a virtual town meeting also give me tremendous pause about calling a large number of individuals to one centralized location, um, calling upon poll workers um, to, to come to the polls as well as voters um, to, for there to be uh, some kind of campaign which could potentially require collection of signatures. Um, I think all of those our factors, but but one what we had discussed um, was so we look we would look at this again or revisit this again um, at the same time we're looking at town meeting to be open whichever is sooner. Right. That was the framing um, we had talked about yesterday. Rather than like the lifting of the state of emergency, it's possible schools will reopen there, but there will still be a state of emergency. It's possible a state of emergency will be lifted, but the schools will remain closed. I don't know that they're not necessarily tied, and there are a lot of um, different indications of um, of how severe the public health threat is. Um, so looking at just one is, is very difficult at this time. And it, it, from every indication, it seems like we're learning more every day um, as to what will be safe to do when, and that there probably will be nothing that is entirely safe because, until there is a vaccine truly, but there's things that can be safer. Right, and, and great point in terms of there may be other ways of voting other than uh, fully in person, although that's not yet implemented and would no, it's not. take a little bit of work, but I think that that's- But that's we may, may, we would likely know more, you know, when we're when, at the end of May, when we're discussing um, town town meeting dates as well. Carlo, I see you got your, your mic on. What are your thoughts? No, I'm just listening. I, I think this is a difficult situation as far as the pandemic goes, but are we going to follow the town charter or not follow the town charter? I see personally the board of registrars issue is a separate issue that is going to be ongoing. Per the charter, our one and only job is to set an election date. I know we have unforeseen circumstances and a lot of unanswered questions going forward as far as what's safe and what isn't. And then there's going to be personal choices of what's safe and what isn't. But I think if we look at our longest date out of 90 days and, and, and revisit it uh, midway of those 90 days, uh, I, I think we need to do what the charter states, uh, in my opinion. Carlo, I think um, I would actually hope that Ray might be able to chime in on this, but um, we can't, once we set it, we can't revisit it halfway. Uh, is the challenge. Once we set it, it's set unless there's something that happens, for example, through a legal challenge or for the Board of Register Registrars, but under the charter, and please, Ray, correct me if I'm wrong, um, under the charter, once we set an election, we can't pull the trigger on that. Um, and Ray, I was, and Mark, I don't want to be chairing the meeting here, but I was hoping that Ray could weigh in on what the charter requires us to do when, with respect to calling, an ele calling the recall election. Please, Ray. Okay, so um, the uh, recall provisions of the charter are all in section 
one one, and um, uh, everybody should um, uh, familiarize themselves with them because it's it, it's important. The 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 point that the hearing process uh, with regard to signatures and the um, the uh, decision to set the election time are not legally intertwined and, and one can go forward without the other is certainly true as a matter of law, as a matter of, of um, um, expediency. However, I think it's, it's reasonable for you to take into consideration what's going on with the uh, Board of Registrars. So that said, here's what, what, the, what the charter says. It says that the election that, that uh, the election cannot occur in the last six months of remaining in the term uh, for which the official was elected. And so uh, counting backwards from the end of, of the term, that means that the election needs to happen no later than the early part of October. Um, and uh, it also says that uh, uh, the select board um, has to set the election date and the election date can only be um, not fewer than 64 days from the date of the vote, not more than 90 days from the date of the vote. So if you put all that together, it means that uh, um, uh, regardless of anything else that's considered, uh, you're going to have to vote on uh, setting this recall election um, sometime probably in the, no later than the month. The, uh, so that it can happen no later than the first week in o October so that um, the charter can be um, uh, complied with. The current state law on postponing of, elec of elections does not apply uh, to, to a recall election. And the charter doesn't give you the ability to, to postpone it once you set it. So um, I share the view that um, that once you set the date, it is locked in concrete and you will have to abide by it. Um, the, the charter does not say, however, how long um, uh, you have um, um, to make the decision. You, uh, there is a provision in 8.11.3 uh, that says, um, uh, a certain number of things that the select board needs to do and providing notice and whatever that, that are subject to the word forthwith. Um, but then it says, if the officer doesn't resign within the five days after the date of such notice, the board of selectmen shall order an election to be held not less than 64 days or not more than 90 days from the date the board of selectmen orders the election. It does not say that the board has to do it on any particular time frame. So uh, you should not feel compelled to, to, um, to vote um, today. It's up to you to decide when you want to vote to set the election, subject to uh, the restrictions that in order to conduct a, a proper election um, by the first week in October, that means the decision has to be made no later than July. So in, in brief, um the charter does not require us to set it forth with, unlike the issue with um, providing the notice to the office holder uh, or the town officer, which we had to do forthwith upon receipt of the certificate. That is correct. Thank you. On that topic, do we have any confirmation that uh, the subject of the petition has received the notification via certified mail? I believe that's how the charter specified it. Uh, It only, it's, the charter specifies merely by mail, postage, prepaid. Oh, prepaid. Not say certified. Okay. That said, um, uh, I believe Bob may have some information about, uh, about the receipt. I did send it registered. I have not yet received a notice back from the post office, um, but I'm only getting mail two or three days a week. 
Okay. Um, thank you for the, um, I didn't, this is our first conversation about this. So um, I had no idea that once you set an election, you can't change it. So I really appreciate um, um, Ray, you being here and, and Anne and Mark that you had this conversation in advance. <clears throat> And um, I'm not comfortable with the safety risks. And um, so I, 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 so I think we've seen laid out here that we kind of have these tight parameters within which we need to work. And my understanding after um, watching the Board of Registrars is that they are going to proceed with the hearing um, based on town council's advice. I think that's correct. They are, they are going to proceed with the hearing, but they have not set the date. And they're, they believe, or at least the discussion was, um, since much of the substance of that hearing will be, is this signature valid? So there's a need to examine the signature that's on the petition versus the signature that's on the voter registration card, if there is one. Um, perhaps the person who, uh, who signed the petition uh, will have submitted something about that um, and we have to do that um, maybe not for every all 900 signatures that have been challenged but at least for enough to make a difference so um, we can expect that that hearing will go on for a good long period of time it will be made much Um, the um, um, and if there are a large number of people who want to participate in it, it will it, it will be even more difficult. So um, I think that it's fair to say that the board of registrars would greatly prefer to hold that hearing um, in the traditional way, um, uh, if that is at all possible. Um, one other clarification um, based on something that Karen said about if we set it, we can't change it. Um, and that is true under the charter. If for, for whatever reason we set it, then the board of registrars holds a hearing and enough signatures are invalidated or there's some other court challenge where the petition is struck down, then even if we had set it, there would be, as Ray, I think you said yesterday, there would be nothing to hold an election about. Is that? Yes, that that, that, that is fair. If, if as a result of um, the Board of Registrar's hearing, um, it is determined that there are in fact not a sufficient number of signatures to um, uh, conduct the recall election, then the recall election is effectively canceled because there will be no uh, no question to present to the voters and uh, and uh, um, nothing to vote on. Um, so even though the charter doesn't explicitly say that the election would be um, uh, would be canceled, um, the um, uh, it would be my view that it would if in effect be canceled. So um, the um, that's why I say it's all right to proceed with calling the election without necessarily knowing the result of the hearing um, uh, because there is a way out. What there is not a way out for is, um, is to postpone the election uh, uh, beyond um, the um, uh, first week of October. And there's no we're still in a state of emergency. We're still too concerned that you know people will be putting their lives at risk. There's no basis well, on there's that. There's nothing in place today that allow us to delay. You know, I I have to concede that you know new legislation has been happening pretty much every couple of days, and um, I can't predict everything that the legislature will dream up to impose on us, um, and. Uh, uh, from where we stand. So certainly there is a possibility that uh, that the uh, that there will be another uh, new act that further regulates elections in some way that 
I can only tell you what's what's the law today. I, I'm not very good at predicting what's going to happen in the future. Thank you. Other board comments discussion before we um, start looking at some of the public comment. All right. Should we um, look at the oldest first? I could just make a comment. Sure, please. Bob. Just as a reminder, there is at least scheduled a state primary election in September. So one would suppose the legislature will need to address the safety of that election sometime early in the summer. Right. I'm wondering, actually, um, you know, I know we haven't taken a vote yet, but if it's worth consulting, I think it will be worth consulting with both the town clerk and the board of health before, it, assuming we're, we're not taking a vote uh, to schedule tonight, um, and that's an assumption, that we consult with the town clerk and the board of health about uh, when and how to, to conduct an election safely. Um, you know, certainly the, I, we've heard recommendations to hold, um, we've received public comment recommending to hold it together with the state primary. My concern um, is that would actually re require um, double the number of poll workers. I'm assuming if it's, if it would be the same as the way um, our town clerk had to operate the joint election in March. Um, and so, you know, having double the number of poll workers means that many more people congregating in one central location. And um, that is a concern of mine. But I think the um, um, guidance regarding safety um, probably makes a lot of sense. Again, we are we may be unique in terms of this uh, a recall election, although not actually completely unique. But there are other elections that need to be scheduled are are going to be scheduled, and there's going to need to be some assistance with it. Um, if it turns out that mail in is part of the election in a broader way, or is the the form of the election, I'm sure that's going to take some preparation. Um, right. But again, I think other people are dealing with this, so it, it's not that we have to necessarily in, reinvent the wheel ourselves. I think that. It, it's it's going to move, you know, at some at some rate. Um, Dealing know, with this meaning meaning municipal election or sorry, not yeah. mean, municipal and just gen generally elections in twenty twenty. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and it's it's difficult thinking through how how to do this. Um, and I think, and you've raised your concern. My concern as well is that if we if we can't assure safety, it's very difficult to kind of force people to make a decision between health and, and, and being disenfranchised. Um, and it's uncomfortable. And we believe we'll learn more um, in the not too distant future about it. And that's the idea, I think, behind establishing a, a, a date, a date certain to have another discussion about it. And if things suddenly are, are moving uh, in a better direction, to have the ability to, to rethink that sooner rather than later. So that, that's, that's, that's the notion behind it. Should we look at some of the public comment and, and bring that in? Um, I, I, again, just for, for feedback from you folks, if we started at the kind of the earliest comments that came in, which I think is, um, is probably Laurie Conway uh, at 7.05, and maybe what we do is, would it make sense to have each board member um, read through a few of them uh, kind of into the record and then we'll we pause and move to the next person. Does that seem like a reasonable approach to it? Sure. And um, point of clarification, would we, so some of them come in without the name and address. So are, are we gonna just skip the ones that really we can't identify them? Yes. Okay. We, we were specific in requesting that information. If okay. they were attending our meeting and I'm, I'm waiting for, for Ray to give me the no you can't do that but I haven't seen that yet so <laughs> I think for our public meetings um, the requirement is when when someone um, wants to make a statement they're more than welcome to but they need to state their name and address yes um, and that's all we're asking for here and we stated that clearly at the start of the meeting um, as well as in the past that that's the requirement so um, shall I start 
floor. Please. So uh, this is uh, from Laurie Conway, and I'm sorry, she sent her address um, in another mail that I saw. Um, if someone else sees it, just, oh, sorry, it's 53 Riverside Drive. Um, hello, I have several questions about the notification to Ms. Alvarado, as well as the objections to such recall petition. I hope these questions will be answered tonight during the meeting. First, I would like to know exactly how the first notification was made to Ms. Alvarado, which should include the date, method, and person making the notification. I'd also like to know who objected to the notification, why it was deemed necessary to do the notification again, and why the wording was changed to make it appear as though the first notification did not take place. I would also like to know specifically how the first notification did not meet the town charter. All these facts should be readily available to taxpayers in town. There are actually a couple more points here. Second, I was completely appalled to see that several hundred taxpayers in this town have had their integrity questioned as their signatures have been considered invalid because of supposed fraudulent activity. I know of a few people who signed in my presence. I also noticed many others who told me they signed. How can something like that happen without any proof? I'm reaching out to those individuals on the list that I personally know to make them aware, and I'm sure that many will be in contact with the Board of Registrars to let them know of the legitimacy of their signatures. I also noticed many first responders on the list, whether it be law enforcement or medical personnel. Do you think these people need to take any time out of the very limited time during this pandemic to prove they're not engaged in unlawful behavior is an absolute disgrace. I hope you all, as well as your families and loved ones, are staying healthy during this pandemic. Personally, I have been doing checks on neighbors, making large quantities of masks to help protect my friends who are directly working with COVID-19 patients and trying to keep my medically fragile daughter safe from catching the virus. I shouldn't have to be taking the time to write to you to express my disgust at taxpayers being falsely accused of crimes instead of doing things to help others during this crisis. Uh, board members, where we know some answers to these questions, should we should we share them here? I think probably we should. So uh, specifically as it relates to, and, and, and Ray, I'm sure you'll chime in if you, if, uh, if you want or feel differently in terms of the notification and the activity, um, we actually um, went by the charter specifically in terms of notification. An objection was made by attorney Newman. Um, and the discussion we had, I'm sorry, the objection that was filed was in our board packet that goes back to that date, which I believe is now two weeks ago. So that, that was publicly filed and it's in the board packet. So it's available there. Um, and then the discussion we had specifically was that um, just to be clear and to remove an objection by sending a notification as we did, um, that, would, that would make it absolutely clear. And we believe without objections that could follow. Uh, get crystal crystal clear I and please someone correct me if I'm wrong sometime in March um, Bob received a copy of the certificate and then sent a uh, a notice to Vanessa forthwith um, at the at um, Ray's recommendation um, with the under the understanding that Bob was, acting as agent of the select board. Um, actual select board members received um, the copy of the certificate on April 1st. And at our meeting that evening, we um, in, voted to instruct Bob to send um, the notice to make it, um, because, if to remove any concern that we hadn't, um, that Bob hadn't been acting as an agent previously. Um, and it was in fact following when the actual select board members were in receipt of the certificate. Okay, let me give it a try too. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the sentence in the, in the charter that we're talking about is in, 8.11.3, and it says, upon its receipt of the certificate, that's the certificate that the Board of Registrars sends certifying the signatures, the Board of Selectmen shall forthwith give written notice of the petition and certificate to the town officer whose recall is sought by mail, postage prepaid, to his address as shown on the most recent voting list and shall cause notice of the petition and certificate to be publicly available. 
Okay, so, um, so uh, in my view, and I really don't think there's any dispute about this, the um, select board uh, receives um, material of all sorts um, when it's delivered to um, uh, the town offices. The, um, it, is, it is not a reasonable interpretation of this to say that the, the individual select board members have to individually receive, uh, receive the um, certificate in order to act. Um, so that's the reason why I advise Bob that he, um, as the recipient of mail for, you know, on behalf of the select board, is entitled to um, uh, act as their agent. Um, Bob's office sends out notices on behalf of the select board all the time, without um, to in a whole variety of circumstances, without um, getting a specific uh, authorization from the select board to do so, because that's part of his um, his duties under the charter. Um, I also noted that it does not say you that the select board has any discretion here. This is not something that the the select board can choose to do or not choose to do. It says, shall forthwith give written notice. And to me, shall forthwith give written notice doesn't mean wait until the next select board meeting. It means do it right away. So that's why I advise Bob that he should do it. Um, Mr. Newman objected to that. And I advise the board that um, we're going to have enough legal issues to fight about uh, along this way that it would just be easier just to do it again and remove this from further controversy. So even though I'm very comfortable that, that Bob's initial notice was entirely appropriate, um, uh, doing it twice is, um, is belt and suspenders and um, nobody can possibly object um, to it having been done. I, and the one other piece is that uh, in terms of timing, uh, it made no difference because um, in either case, there would not have been time for the, the five-day clock at whatever point it started would not have run by our, um, that's by our that's April 1st meeting. That's correct. That's correct. So that's why a second notice was sent. And... Um, 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 Lawyers always like to take the safest way out of any situation. And this is an example of um, uh, if you think that it should have been that the word forthwith is the most important part of this sentence, we did that. And if you think receipt of the certificate should be interpreted to mean individual select board members had it in their possession, we did it that way too. Thanks, Ray. Thank I think the, the next point brought up here um, relates to um, what's happening with the Board of Registrars and signatures. Um, so the, the board held a meeting last week. And during that meeting, they decided whether or not to hold a hearing based on the objection that they had received. And they voted to, in fact, um, have, have a hearing. Um, and so that's the kind of how that one is is proceeding at this point that they're they've agreed to have a hearing based on the objection. So I think that, that pretty much answers that question. So I just to, just to be clear, nothing has been proven. The fact that somebody alleges and that there is an objection does not mean that underlying facts have been proven. And at that hearing, the board of registrars will require proof. Um, and um, they will make their decision based on the evidence that's presented to them. Um, okay, so uh, Tim Kerwans was read, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, Wow. 
Um, maybe I should pass to the next person. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, James Flaherty, 15 Chequesset Road. Uh, so the message here is recall agenda item. The town home rule charter is very specific relating to recall procedures and removal of an elected board or committee member. As documented in article 8.11, there's no mention made of allowing variance for date or dates of submittal of required documents, et cetera. Once a petition has been certified, transmitted to the board of select persons, notice given to the town officer and that town officer did not resign within five days, then the board of selectmen shall order an election at this point in time, a certified petition had been issued, addressed by the Board of Select Persons and formally transmitted to the applicable board person. Subsequent, subsequently, the Board of Registrars on April 8, 2020 voted for a public meeting for the recall petition. Does this constitute a request or a requirement to the Board of Select Persons? Can the petition as certified and transmitted be rescinded and replaced by a public meeting by the Board of Registrars? Are there now two motions on the Board of Select Persons table relating to the same subject? The drafters of the Town Home Rule Charter recognize the need for a difference in the method of recall of an elected versus an appointed member as defined in Article 8.11 and 8.12. An appointed member's only recourse for support would be by holding a public hearing, whereas an elected member has the full weight of their constituents in defeating the recall. Did the Board of Registrars fully realize and or recognize that by voting for a public meeting after the fact, that this were to require an in-person open forum type of meeting that could not be held during the current emergency situation and may not be held prior to the elapse of the petition go to the home rule charter time constraints. Um, I think that's actually a registrar's Does the board of select, I'm, I'm, there are two paragraphs here that relate specifically to the board of registrar's discussion and the public meeting they would propose holding. Does the Board of Select Persons, based on the time of responses and regardless of registrar subsequent motions, require an election to be held within the time frame given in the town charter? If the above is not correct, how did the Board of Registrar's Board of Select Persons demonstrate they fully complied with the town charter? There are 2,239 certified signatures on the recall petition. 500 to 900 signatures are being challenged. The 500 number was stated by the lawyer for the board member. The 900 was stating during the Board of Registrar's meeting are there pages missing in the board agenda submittal which may account for the disparity? The town registrar certified the recall petition. If 25 to 50% of the signatures are invalid or questionable, is there some major fault in the means slash method of certification? What were the bases for the challenges on the signatures? Uh, this is specific to the registrars. The, the, uh, the last three paragraphs are specific to the registrars and the signature uh, by Mr. Flaherty. Um, it, it, do we just have, I'm not sure, have we covered that or? Maybe I, I can give it a, a little quick run through for you. Great, thank um, you. The charter does not require that the board of registrars hold a hearing. It, in theory, at least, the Board of Registrars could simply act on the objections without holding a hearing. If they did so, however, um, remember that, um, uh, that we still live in a, um, uh, in a world where we provide due process um, to people who have disputes. Um, so it would mean that um, the objectors would be able to go to court and get their hearing there. Um, and um, that hearing would be much more formal, would require sworn witnesses, cross-examination, all that kind of stuff that you would normally see in a trial. It probably, and um, the the decision would then be made by a judge. By holding the hearing, by electing to hold the hearing, um, the uh, registrars retain, retain control over 
uh, the review of the evidence. And if their decision were appealed, the only question would be whether they had acted arbitrarily and capriciously. So um, it, it was um, uh, my recommendation to the Board of Registrars that they agree to the request for a hearing, even though it's not required, so that they would have the first shot at evaluating the evidence and making a decision rather than having it go directly to uh, the Superior Court. Thank you, Ray. Um, there is a message here from uh, Kathy Zeke, but I don't see an address. Perhaps if you could send us your address, we can we can come back to that one. Um, Rebecca Bailey, Forest Glen Road. To the select board, please don't schedule an election for the recall of Vanessa Alvarado until the Board of Registrars has held a hearing on the objections to the recall petition and signatures. It's important that the validity of the petition be confirmed or rejected before any other action gets taken, especially given the circumstances of the coronavirus pandemic and our inability to keep voters safe and healthy during an election process. Someone like to take the next three? Um, you want me to try? Aaron, you're on. <laughs> okay, let's see how big these are. Okay. Okay, uh, at 7.45 p.m. Um, okay, we have a, <clears throat> a letter from, uh, an email from Dimitra to Xeris at 106 Oak Street. Please do not place a recall vote on the calendar until and unless the Board of Registrars gets to do their job and hold the public hearing they desire in order to fully investigate the recall petition and the objections raised regarding May. I'm sure you know this, but I feel it has to be pointed out that for Weld Ainsminger Arena to vehemently call for the selection to be held ASAP, put this, uh, puts the citizens of Reading in into danger. Okay, it's insane to hold a recall election during a worldwide pandemic, especially if one can, one can be held in September when we go to the polls anyway. This would save the town money and hopefully not endanger all of us regarding the virus. If the recall is to be anything but a sham exercise in divisiveness and misogyny, misogyny uh, sorry. All of the steps to fight it should be permitted to play out. Perhaps someone should convince this group to just run a candidate against Miss Alvarado in April. That makes the most sense of all. Okay, that's just a statement, I think. Next one, um, Keith Moulton, 31 Van Norden Road. I hope you discuss the recount fully. I hope the recall is taken seriously as my signature was questioned and I feel that those that signed the petition should be taken seriously. Everyone, should support the police department. Additionally, um, I hope the recall passes. Okay, so, all right. Okay, um, Carolyn Whiting. We have to stop on that one also. We don't have an address. Yeah, I Carolyn think there's an Whiting. address on that one. Okay. address, we can address it. Yep. Sorry, okay. we can talk about it. You want me to do one more or pass it on? One more, please. Okay, you got it. Okay. Um, Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, Carrie Martell Longfellow Road. Is that okay? I understand the need to delay public meetings during COVID-19, but strongly urge the select board to proceed with scheduling a virtual public hearing in regard to the recall of Vanessa Alvarado. No questions in that one, I think. So that three? Yep. Well, four, unless an, um, an address comes in. Uh, Anne, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, uh, Dan Ensminger, if you could send in your address. Um, okay. Then we have, oh, these are bike lane. Okay. Um, Meredith 331 Van Norden Road. Hello, sec select board. I'm not sure which is worse, Miss Alvarado and her attorney, attorney and their attempt to stall the recall or the way the select board has to date allowed them to do so. It's absolutely confounding to me that the board is acquiescing to these tactics. Please do your jobs and follow the charter. Please do your jobs and not allow your differences to the, allow the voice of over 2000 voters go unheard. I think we have an address from for uh, Dan Insminger that's come in. Okay. At 6 Oakland Road. Okay, 6 Oakland Road. So 
Um, ladies and gentlemen, over 2,200 of your fellow citizens have signed a petition demanding that the select board call a special election to decide on the recall of Vanessa Alvarado. Please honor their request in a timely manner pursuant to section 8.11.3 of the Reading Home Rule Charter. This should proceed apace and without delay, notwithstanding any challenges to the recall petition that are pending before the Board of Registrars. Um, uh, Meredith Reed, who emailed about the recall, also asked why the next select board meeting date isn't until three weeks out on May 5th. Um, that, that doesn't, that's not accurate, right? We, we're meeting next Wednesday, Mark. Yes, to be clear, we will be meeting on a weekly basis every Wednesday for the foreseeable future. Um, and then Angela Binda, 10 Orchard Park Drive. Dear Chairman Doxer and members of the select board, thank you for all you are do doing during unprecedented and difficult time. After watching the Board of Registrar's meeting, I feel that it is completely necessary to have an in-person hearing and to see the legal challenge by SB member Alvarado play out before setting a date for a recall election. In this time, with all uncertainty caused by the pandemic, please do not rush to set a date which may not be able to be kept or could put citizens in danger, especially before the Board of Registrar's holds a hearing. Carla, would you like to grab the next few? please. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we have an address. This is from Mike Monahan, Bancroft Ave. If it is safe enough for people to enter grocery stores 150 at a time to purchase groceries, it is safe enough to have a recall election in a similar fashion, allow only 100-ish people Um, we have another one from Dan. Can I read that one again? Uh, the one from 904. Uh, yeah. So Dan is bringing out Oakland Road. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not disenfranch disenfranchise the voters of this town by unreasonably delaying the recall election. The Supreme Court of Wisconsin overturned the governor's plan to delay the Wisconsin presidential primary. There are safe ways to conduct a regular election with social distancing as was done there. Maybe material, I think she provided an address further up, I wanna say. Uh, Hi, yes, 22 Deborah Drive. Okay. So this came at 906, uh, Eileen Materio, Deborah Drive. It is shameful that Ms. Alvarado and her attorney are challenging hundreds of valid signatures, claiming that the person who signed the petition is not the person who actually signed the petition. As a valid signer, it is incumbent upon them to produce credible evidence. In other words, proof that the signatures are invalid. The burden of proof is on Ms. Ms. Alvarado and her attorney, not the signers to defend their credibility. If the claimants produce no evidence, you as a select board have the responsibility and duty to the voters of Reading it's a scheduled election per order of the town charter. Um, okay, I can press on that one. Marion Downing, as I'm watching the discussion now, if Ray is there, can he offer guidance on whether if Vanessa's attorney has made a signature challenge with or without proof? And any person whose signature is being challenged affirmatively emails board of registrars to confirm Yes, that is his or her signature. Is that sufficient to moot or overcome the objection? So that's a question. <laughs> Further to the objections to the signatures, can Ray opine about whether the objector needs to provide some proof in advance to lend credibility to the allegation of fraud in 900 signatures? My understanding is that this attorney has not even obtained actual official signature exemplars from the town. For any, for any objector to signature, and is also alleging facts that which no proof whatsoever seems possible without witness testimony, such as alleging one person signed for multiple others. The signature objections seem to be a delay tactic, offered without any proof upfront, designed to ensure the recall election takes place so late that is less than six months before next election. I'm going to keep on going or pass it off. 
Uh, I can I can pick up the next the next ones. Um, I'm looking at uh, Mike Monahan, 909 p.m. Does that look like the next one? Uh, it looks like a 909 into 913. Uh, so the 909 is, please do not make the same error again. Excuse me, I'll go back. Select board delays on the chief of police is what caused all these problems. Please do not make the same error again by creating additional delays relative to the recall vote. Do your job, follow the charter, set a recall vote date and set it tonight. Allow the voters to choose their own level of risk for the vote versus the select board deciding for us as voters, just like they do every time they decide to go food shopping. And that's followed up at 913. Um, the below statement by Laura Jem establishes that the Board of Registrars matter should have no vote in the bearing of your responsibility to set a recall vote date tonight. Um, I'm gonna rule that one out of order. That's a registrar's issue. Uh, Carrie Perry, 307 West Street. I think I see are these two two identical ones, I believe, from Ms. Perry. I think they are. Um, Dear Select Board, the Board of Registrar's hearing is a separate situation. We had another delay tactic. It should be a parallel but not dependent issue to when a recall election should be set. I would recommend the Select Board did it, set a date now for the recall election without further delay and allow absentee ballots for voting as needed in full. Therefore, there is not a decision of health versus being able to vote. There is also the option of TV campaigning to reach the town and the virtual meetings. Uh, and then I have one from Peggy Gallagher, 62 Tennyson Road. Is the town going to notify the person whose signature is being challenged? And I think that's a registrar's uh, matter, I believe. Am I correct on that, right? Uh, yes, you are. I think that brings us current. So back to board members. What are, what are our thoughts here? Um, I, I did want to um, address one comment that was raised by Dan Ensminger regarding the safety of elections in Wisconsin last week. I actually had sent Mark um, a piece that I'd found in the Washington Post that was written by a poll worker in Wisconsin, um, and it was called, Wisconsin Made Me Risk My Life to Help People Vote on Tuesday. Um, he said that he, this individual wrote, even though I joke that there are worse things to die for than defending the right to small d democratic civic engagement, I'm 51 and in pretty good health. The chances that I will catch COVID-19 and die are fairly remote. But to me, the elevated risk feels like walking into somebody's living room and seeing a loaded gun lying around in plain sight. The chances they will pick it up and kill me are slim, but they should really put it away. I'd rather not play the odds. Voting in Wisconsin was dangerous today and it didn't have to be. Um, he goes on, um, and, and let's see, um, I didn't work uh, at the polls, potentially putting my health on the line for any one political party. I did it for everybody, Democrats, Republicans, the unaffiliated. We poll workers showed up not out of whatever party loyalty we may have, but out of a more basic principle. We want to help our fellow citizens make themselves, um, heard. But he says, uh, if I do die of this stupid virus because I took part in an ill-advised election, I want people to know you have my complete permission to politicize my death, push for mail-in bat ballots, push for voting reform, make sure every anti-democratic politician who callously risked their constituents' lives has to answer for it. Um, and I know there's been a lot of talk of, and concern about delays um, by the select board. And I'm willing to take the heat um, for that um, and not schedule election an election today that would risk the lives of our constituents. 
Okay. And I, you know, I'm planning to follow, I fully plan to follow the charter um, and schedule an election at a time I have better information as to when it will be safe to do so. Um, we are not co compelled under the charter to schedule today. Um, and to do so today would be um, irresponsible and risking people's lives uh, unnecessarily. Thank you. Carlo, did you have a comment? Uh, no, I'm just have it on just so that you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Karen? Um, the safety is still paramount. I, I found this evening's discussion to be very helpful. Thank you very much, Ray, for laying it out there. Um, I like the proposal to reevaluate on May 27th. Um, we don't know what the situation is going to be in, be around here in the next few weeks. And, and we have heard that the Board of Registrars does want to proceed with a hearing. So I think we need to keep that in mind. And um, it was very helpful to, and, and we've been struggling with how to make town meeting happen. So I think the election is, is very similar to town meeting in terms of safety and difficulty with the added information that we have tonight that once it's scheduled, it can't be changed. So um, I, I don't think we can put people's lives in danger. And at the same time, interrupt a process that is going to be happening. We don't actually know when the um, Board of Registrars will be able to schedule their hearings safely as well. I mean, I, we're not talking about having any hearings in town whatsoever for the foreseeable future. And we're gonna be discussing a policy that Ray's gonna do that for us. So I like um, reevaluating this um, May 27th um, and you know, God willing, we will be in a much better position health-wise and be better able to um, comply with the charter um, in a safe manner. Thank you, Karen. Um, just a, a quick follow-on also, um, I've been following uh, the Wisconsin discussion and I'll share some articles, but there was a, the latest update from that is that the number of people that felt disenfranchised by that decision um, is quite substantial. And I am just not comfortable uh, having that take place. I just don't think that's the right, the right approach to it here. Um, I do think that um, we you know, will need to move forward. The issue is uh, setting timing. I think this timing is reasonable. I think it, it is sensible. I think it, it meets the, the requirements of, of what needs to happen. Um, and I think it, it is in the interest of the public to do it the right way. I understand a couple more emails came through. Uh, so from Krista Rubin, Fairchild Drive, please answer the question submitted by Mary Ann Downing. This was not answered. Um, let's go back if we can. Uh, so if I'm reading this correctly, uh, Marianne Downing's comment was asking specifically about a method of approving signatures and the signature challenge, which I believe is a matter specifically for the registrars and not for the select board. I think that's out of our purview. Oh, sorry. Um, so thank you, Marianne. Um, the question is whether advanced, sorry, let me read it exactly. Hi there. Ray didn't answer my question in the past email on whether advanced proof is to help ensure that the objection is not just a delay tactic. Uh, again, I think that this is registrars, but Ray, I would, your thought on that? Well, let me just say that um, that in our 
judicially in, in our legal system, people are entitled to uh, make allegations in a proper form. And in this case, it's to the board, board of uh, registrar. The um, allegations are at this point, just allegations. Uh, they're not required to prove the allegations in order to have a hearing where they'd be allowed to prove them. Uh, but once they make them, the Board of Registrars is, it has the option, in this case, of holding a hearing. At that point, the burden of proof will be on um, uh, the, uh, the person raising the, object the objection. So in this case, um, uh, Vanessa and her attorney will have to come forward with evidence to, to substantiate their allegations. Um, um, and the... Uh, that proof will have to be rendered at that time, but it doesn't have to be rendered before then. Okay. Um, there's one last one here. Um, Joyce Gould, 17 John Street. Why isn't it possible to schedule an election now using absentee ballots, which would keep the entire morning public safe? Maybe, I'm sorry, it must be voting, sorry. I'm guessing it's a typo, entire voting. So, so, so the answer is we don't have the authority to run an election exclusively with absentee ballots. When the election laws require us to open the polls on a specific date and um, to uh, uh, allow voters to come in and cast their ballots, that's the way the elections, the election laws work today. Um, so, To be eligible to vote by absentee, you must be one absence for, from the voter's city or town on election day, or the, it must be due to physical disability or religious belief. That is true too. Um, so I, I had said that would be the last one. There, there is one more. What does the board think? Should we accept this last one? Or call it or close? Take this last one. Okay, this will be the last one, 9.54 p.m. from Sean Brandt, Franklin Street. Can you clarify whether the board could set an election date even if you wanted to? I believe you stated earlier in the meeting that Ms. Alvarado has not yet received the letter, nor has the five-day window even begun. So it seems it would be jumping the gun to set an election date tonight, regardless of the outcome of any hearing or the pandemic. So I think the, what Bob said was that he sent the letter with a return receipt request and that green card has not come back to him. So we do not have proof of when it was received. Um, so we don't actually know whether the five days, um, and remember that's five business days, um, is, um, ha has elapsed or not. Um, we didn't focus on that because I think the conversation has mostly gone on with respect to the safety of conducting the, the election. But uh, at some point it's necessary to confirm when the um, um, notice was received. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Carla. Carlo, I think you're on mute. You're muted. Sorry. Ray, does that mean if the green card never comes back, uh, the proponent would have to be notified again? <laughs> uh, no. Um, the law um, isn't as, uh, as dumb as that. Um, there is a, a rule sometimes referred to as the mailbox rule. Um, that allows you, in the absence of any proof to the contrary, to assume that the um, that the uh, that a letter was received three days after it was mailed. Okay, thank you. So we obviously it would be better to get the green card back, um, and um, um, sometimes that takes a, a few days, but otherwise um, we will. 
assume that it was received three days after it was mailed. So does that mean the five day window would take us into next week or the end of this week, theoretically? It, um, so it was mailed on April Thursday, 2nd. as I recall last week. April 2nd, I think. Thursday of the, all right, here we go, trying to figure out the calendar. On the first, and it was supposed to go out the next day. Yeah, it was, okay. um, I have it postmarked April 2nd. Yeah. Okay, so it was the second. Um, so if you, um, no, yeah, you, it's, it's the middle of this week, the five days would be elapsed. Right. So, um, so under the charter, we only count Monday through Thursday. We don't count Friday. So um, uh, the, the mailbox rule would allow us to, um, uh, to assume if it was mailed on the second, that it was received um, on Monday the 6th. Five days after that would be the seven, eight, nine. Uh, Yesterday. 13, 14, so midnight tonight. Would, would the board be comfortable with, since things are changing so fast and daily, and I agree the health and safety of the town is paramount, that the our guidance for a state of emergency goes through, I believe, May 3rd or May 4th. So instead of waiting till the end of May, that we pick that week as guidance. I think that seems more reasonable than waiting till the end of May. Carlo, that's um, partly why I was thinking the end of May or when schools reopen, which right now is scheduled for May 4th, but may or may not take place. I thought that might be a good barometer for when things start to um, when some of the restrictions start to loosen up. I, I don't know if you have a reaction to that. I, yeah, we, we don't know what's gonna happen. That's again, I think the, the issue uh, among other things with a lot of people being upset um, about their signatures being challenged, but that's a separate matter. Our job is to set an election date. And I agree with all of you that given the current situation, we have to, uh, tread lightly on that, but I'd like to go by the guidance of what the governor has in place today, and that could change tomorrow. And that's all I'm saying is that I agree that the next guidance is coming, I believe on May 4th, um, to lift the state of emergency, to extend it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Um, I don't think the state of emergency has a, um, an sorry, end date I, right now. I, I meant non-essential, you're correct, I'm sorry. Um, the return of uh, uh, not essential. You're right. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's the reopening of schools, et cetera, um, is, is currently set for May 4th, although I think a lot of people suspect it will be extended, um, which is kind of why I was thinking tying it to that. But um, other, do, sorry, uh, if I will um, yield the floor to other members. So, uh, Karen, I'll, I'll step in for a sec. So um, this is going to change daily, um, I think, is the reality. And we can't predict exactly what will happen or when. Um, and we're, we're trying to use our best guidance. We just have agreed that town meeting um, makes sense to push out un, until you know, this, this June time frame and to, to relook the, the decision once we have a lot more information. And hopefully, we'll have that lot more information in the latter part of May. Um, and that was the reasoning behind using that date. I, I don't think that we can get into a situation of having this be the main agenda item for every meeting that we have that takes place. I think that we need to find a way to um, get ourselves some comfort that by such and such a date, you know, we'll, we'll revisit it. Um, if things change sooner than that in a dramatic fashion, and I think Anne's suggestion of, of the schools uh, reopening would be a great example of that. Um, then to me, that, that says, no, things are, are changing faster. You should reassess that date. You should come back to this sooner. Um, 
and that was my reasoning in in in, in, in talking about that that date of uh, of late May. Karen, do you have any any thoughts on it? No, I was just thinking about uh, if um, <clears throat> I was thinking back to town meeting if. The schools were to reopen. That's a pretty close approximation of the conditions in which you need to have town meeting. So, <clears throat> although we took a motion to not look at it till May twenty seventh, uh, if the schools are reopened on May fourth, which I'm having a hard time believing that's going to happen, then that would also give us a better comfort level about um, town meeting as well. So, if uh, <clears throat> so, Governor Baker usually gives his updates what at the end of the day on the fourth. And then potentially we could revisit it on our meeting. I was looking at the calendar on May 12th, if, if the schools were to reopen. So, so are you suggesting use the May 27th, but if the schools reopen, uh, which is a decision that needs to be coming fairly soon, mm -hmm. that we should revisit it. And that probably would be uh, early May, although conceivably it could be sooner if a decision gets made sooner. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm personally fine with May 27th. That's an excellent point that we don't want to consume every meeting with this topic. Town staff's doing a great job of delivering, you know, 80 to 85 percent of services. The construction projects are ongoing. There could be other things that we could be accomplishing during this time uh, that could also, you know, help us prepare to open. So I'm personally fine with May 27th. Um, if Ann would like to, or someone would like to propose, um, or if the schools reopen, you know, I could probably be open to that as well. Any other thoughts? Motion or just a sense of the board? <laughs> There are a couple other emails that have come in and, and just one in particular, I just, there was an individual who said that their email hadn't been read. I think it was skipped over Bruce Cooper, uh, 20 Covey Hill Road, Reading. Um, I think I did look at that one. Oh, it's, it's very it's specific to the Board of Registrars, registrars. Okay. their process, but okay. I don't think it's in our purview. Okay. Okay, so your question is, should there be a motion or, or is the sense of the board adequate? Um, so um, you certainly don't need a motion if all you're going to do is, um, is uh, not act. But since you're, you have a specific plan that you want to put into place, it seems to me to make sense that that be put into a motion and voted on. Thank you. Very clear answer. Um, so I think we 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 need to make a motion. I move voted. that we revisit this agenda item on May twenty seventh, or at the first meeting following the reopening of the public schools, whichever comes sooner. Second. Any discussion? Not appearing. We'll take a vote. Uh, I'm going in order on the screen. Carlo? Uh, no. Ann? Yes. Karen? Yes. And Mark? Yes. So we are three to one. Um, Ann, can you ask Vanessa to come back, please? Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Ray. I will take leave of you now. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ray. Thanks for your help. You're very welcome. Take care. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the agenda, and I'm seeing a, um, still quite a bit of stuff to do. It's ten o'clock. <laughs> um, would it make sense to uh, go? Should we go a little bit out of order? So we, we have the ad hoc committee, we have the communications subcommittee, we have the liaisons, VASC, and volunteers. Um, I would 
think it'd be okay to take the liaison VASC and volunteers and move that to next week, um, if that's okay with folks. Sorry, hi, Vanessa. So what we're, we're doing, I'm looking at the clock and seeing that it's 10.07. And I'm wondering if the board would um, slightly adjust the agenda so that we talk about the ad hoc committee. We talk about the communication subcommittee. And then we talk about future meeting topics and we move the liaison assignments, the VASC and volunteers to next Wednesday. How do other members feel about that? Um, that's fine with me. I didn't know if um, I, we can, we can also, I can bring up the ad hoc committee. And then if we decide that we would like to defer that to next week to have a conversation in the context of liaison assignments as people are thinking about um, the various roles they'll take on for the select board, that's also fine with me, but I can certainly um, get provide an update and we can decide whether or not we'd like to vote on it tonight, if you'd like. Um, I, I'm detecting you prefer to do it in conjunction with the liaison assignments. Um, it's really more for others. I would like to con continue serving on the ad hoc committee. I'd be looking for another board member to do so. Um, so it's it's up to others, I suppose. Oh, if you guys, I, I'm I'm easy on this. Is is there a, a desire to? I mean, we could go a bit later if that's okay with folks. I'd love. Right. I'd be willing to listen to the update tonight. <laughs> okay. okay. So. All right, that's all right. Why don't we do this if everyone's okay with it? And if you could do an update on the ad hoc committee, that would be great. And then um, we could have it come up again next week along with six select board liaison assignments. Um, okay. I think it would be very valuable to have another discussion on communications so that communication and judging where we are on timing, why don't we adjourn until next week? Since we're meeting every week now, I think we could afford to do that. Very good. Uh, so, the with respect to the ad hoc committee, um, as folks may remember, what I presented the proposal that the ad hoc committee had come up with with respect to a human rights related organization to the board of library trustees. They had asked that I go back to the full ad hoc committee um, uh, to develop the proposal further and to respond to some concerns that residents had raised about the proposal at the Board of Library Trustees meeting. Um, I uh, understand that the school committee has nominated two of its members to serve on the ad hoc committee because the, uh, the committee is down three members based on the last election cycle. Um, so Sean Brandt and John Parks um, were nominated by the school committee. Andrew Grimes has agree agreed to stay on as a representative of the Board of Library Trustees. Uh, I would be happy to continue the work um, of the ad hoc committee for continuity's sake. Um, and we'd be looking for one uh, other member of the select board to serve on the ad hoc committee. Um, I had sent uh, to the uh, full select board uh, a draft motion um, to, in, to reconstitute and um, this, change the sunset date for the ad hoc committee from June to December. Um, originally, we'd envisioned a June set, sunset date anticipating that a proposal would come before April town meeting. Um, the proposal is not ripe to have come before annual town meeting. Um, so, Conceivably, it could come before November town meeting. I suspect the um, proposal will change somewhat based on resident feedback um, and the economic realities that our town, state, and world are facing. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any feeling right now about who might be interested in, in participating or if you'd prefer to think about that in the context of, of other responsibilities you'll be taking on um, with liaison assignments. Anyone have uh, thoughts? I'm not sure if it was on anyone's list specifically. So um, just a question. So 
and this is in general, that's a long list of liaison assignments. Yeah. I, I, you know, I have a couple of priorities that I'm very interested in, but otherwise I'm quite flexible. So um, is this like Monopoly where we do some horse trading and so <laughs> how does this work? So uh, we talked in our last meeting about setting, um, I'm going to call it some priorities where there would be high level of, of interaction taking place for a limited number of assignments per person. Mm -hmm. um, and then possibly what we could also do is then divvy up what's left and um, agree that it's not the same active level of, of participation, but definitely encourage those boards to to know that person X is the the right liaison to come through. Should there be any questions or or need for uh, for discussion, so that we talked about having everyone start with three that they really prefer, um, and then it's certainly possible to add others as as you would like to or or, or feel is is kind of critical to the to the process. You know, there are a few beyond the ones that I think we all know and love. You know, someone has to be on the audit committee. There are a few others like that. Nothing against the audit committee, but you know, it might not be everyone's first choice. <laughs> there are a few like that. Hey, what was that, Bob? Karen's husband. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I, yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, but I will say they are infrequent and they are quick. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, I shouldn't say it, but they're, they're not that. They're not that bad. Really doable. It's quite. I, I could. I've been doing it for several years on FinCom as well as on Select Board. But um, there's that whole list to go through. And, and again, I think you know. I was going to suggest we we delay that um, and not do it tonight. So you know, and maybe what we should do is take your suggestion. Let, let's hang on to that. Let's think about it in the context of next Wednesday. Very good. Go through the list. And and everyone, I I know many. The number that you think are high priority. Um, we should also just think about which groups and committees um, we need to have a, a very strong presence with versus those where we're we're absolutely going to be inviting the chairs to to reach out whenever they have an issue. Um, and then Carlo, you you had brought up the point we talked about this also of maybe there is a regular uh, opportunity for boards and committees to come and and share uh, at a select board meeting. Maybe it's on a quarterly basis or. or something like that, that we have a, a meeting and a couple of groups might come in. And I, I think that's something we should entertain also. And I think we should just make that part of the kind of the, the whole thing. Um, if we're not gonna talk about the assignments tonight, we're gonna wait a week. I'm not thinking of anything that can't wait for a week. In other words, boy, we, we have to have a liaison in there before next week. I, I'm not thinking of anything that kind of precludes us from waiting a week. Anybody have a something that does? I think we're covering public safety, board of health, RMLD. Um. I think you got to cover. Is there? I that gets fine, uh, a week. Um, but shoot, is it preemptive to put out a call for the open slots that we want filled sooner than later for applications, or we have to wait until we get assigned to a committee? No, no, I think we can uh, encourage people to um, to take a look at all the different opportunities in terms of, of completing the exact list. Um, what Bob had mentioned earlier and Caitlin had been working on is there's a note that's about to go out to uh, folks whose terms are expiring this year to ask if they would like to continue in their role. Um, and once we have the answer to that, which will be the end of April, then we, we have a, a more complete picture of what things are going to look like. But to your point, there are already a lot of openings. Um, and it's never too early to start asking people to please engage, to think about the areas they'd be interested in. There is a form where it asks you to um, check off all the different activities that you would have interest in. And we certainly would encourage people to, to fill that out with multiple checks, um, just thinking about what they might want to do. I think that would be great. And then we should think about our message and, and kind of how to get it out there. I know in the past, We've um, had an article written that would go into the papers. Um, we've had some statements, um, which actually is leading beautifully into the discussion of the communications subcommittee. <laughs> They're thinking about how we should, we should do this. But I, I think we wanna um, encourage as many volunteers as we possibly can to, to sign up for as many things as they possibly would have interest in. 
preemptive to, you know, put that out there today for the ones that we want to fill sooner than later. Not, I know the letter, there's a letter going out and emails going tomorrow, but like we discussed in the past few weeks about FinCom and other committees that have vacancies, multiple vacancies, or do we want to do that all at once? That's all yeah. I'm asking. Uh, well, so maybe we should take a look at the list. I've, I've already reached out to the chair of FinCom um, and we've got a call scheduled for the end of the week um, to talk to him about uh, timing um, on the process. Um, part of it too is just making sure, and um, I think we need to just follow up with Laura on can the whole process happen online? Is the form available online? I'm not sure if it is. It is, Caitlin says yes. It's already available online, so that's awesome. The, so, the form, if they're not currently a volunteer and they want to volunteer, is online. Um, the people who are volunteers right now and the terms are ending, those are the ones that are getting the letters that we'll be sending out this week. Great, thanks. Okay, so the form is online. So um, if we just kind of craft a message to folks and ask them to start filling the form out um, and, and you can start anytime. Yeah, for the benefit of the board, um, if you go on the home page, there's actually one of the tabs on the left hand side that says volunteer opportunities. A lot of information there. Great. Okay. So there's no time like the present. So right here, readingma.gov on the homepage, it says volunteer opportunities. And if you click on it and if my internet is working, then here you go. Volunteer application is right here. So you feel like kind of who you are here. I encourage you to, to check off all of the ones that you would have interest in serving on. And, and please, ideally, if there's more than one, identify that. Uh, and then any experience that you might have, just reasons why uh, you're interested and why you'd be a good person to, to join the board. I'm not ready for that vote yet. Um, Okay, so why don't we uh, move on to the uh, communication subcommittee. And if, Vanessa and Ann, if you could uh, kind of give us an update on, on where you are and, and thoughts on, I think you were talking about separating into two groups. Yes, so Ann and I um, met remotely uh, or virtually last week to talk about um, specifically a social media presence for the board. Um, there, I do have a draft policy that will need town council's um, significant input um, as well as the boards. So Mark, I, I'm gonna table that for now. You and I perhaps can talk about how to move that forward in a way that makes sense with Ray. Um, as far as having a Facebook page itself, um, what we talked about was um, creating a simple Facebook page for the board to start. Um, it would need to have a um, few pertinent pieces of information about the board itself and the town, contact information, et cetera. Um, we discussed what types of information, uh, what the content would be as well as um, who would be responsible for it. Um, the content um, we agreed that our recommendation to the full board is that they be strictly factual information, um, that we provide links to the um, RCTV YouTube page, that we post packets. Um, and there was also the possibility of including um, town updates for COVID-19. Um, all of this would be content that primarily aims to redirect people to the appropriate location on the town website or YouTube. Um, uh, we recommend that there not be public comment, um, so that that be locked, um, but that there would be a button so that people could email us. Um, as far as who would post and how, there are a few different options. 
Um, but the one we thought would be the most manageable is that the board members would rotate on who hosts, um, perhaps on a monthly basis. Um, and staff members, uh, appropriate staff members would also have access to the site as needed. Um, the idea would be to have no more perhaps than three or four posts a week, um, which would keep it at a manageable level um, for any of the board members who uh, are interested in posting. Um, and then the other recommendation we had is to set a date um, perhaps six months from now to determine, to sort of revisit the type of content, how it's going, is it working, um, to find we're getting emails um, from people that are being redirected from the, from the Facebook page. Um, and as far as um, next steps, the board would need to decide if this is the direction we want to go in. Um, the page would need to be created and we would need to decide who posts first to get us started. Great, thanks. Um, and I don't know if there's anything I, I left out that you might want to add. Vanessa, I apologize. I had to step away for, for a moment. Um, I am I am back. Um, and I appreciate your providing your providing the update. But um, I'm certainly comfortable um, with what Vanessa and I had discussed, um, and I'm comfortable in the future. Our kind of going are, are dissolving the subcommittee and working um, uh, on separate uh, but parallel tracks um, to get the work of the subcommittee done um, as individual thought leaders. So one of those would be um, communication um, amongst the board and with Bob and the other person, thought leader, um, could focus on the social media side. And per actually, particularly the, oh, the, and the former with residents. Yes. Yeah. With Bob and, and residents, I think, um, mm -hmm. primarily, rather than amongst the board, which is pretty um, regulated by open meeting law already. Uh, Mark, would you mind if I ask a question? Please. Um, I'm not sure if this is for all members or, or maybe for the subcommittee, but um, if you wouldn't mind looking at the website, your select board page, and give us suggestions. Um, we add things when, when select board members have asked, but then we never take things away. <laughs> so if you especially look at the left-hand uh, margin, there's some topics like Tarrant Lane that are old. So it's not a bad opportunity to just kind of refresh the information on that page as well. So for everyone's benefit just for a second. Okay, go ahead. Exactly. So I think part of the, I guess the, uh, the external, if you will, would include this, right? So that would, a lot of it was recommendations for what should go to the town website, but it also is meant to be separate and focused on is it Facebook that it's going to be focused on that we're talking about? Yes. Okay. Um, and just for information, what kinds of items do you think we would post there? You mentioned kind of three or four times a week. Um, so we, we've talked about, you know, kind of COVID-19 updates and having the board able to speak with one voice and put all the information out. So I, I, that one I see. Are there some other examples of what we might want to do that way? Mm -hmm. the posting the packet. Packet. And, and once um, the RCTV video is up on YouTube, which is usually on Fridays, sometimes it's Thursdays, um, that may change as our meetings are on Wednesday, but generally two or three days later um, to post the link to the meeting itself. There are also other things that we can post, you know, as we look longer term, um, including summaries of our meetings, um, items that are posted on the um, RPD page or on the town page. But um, as we talked through sort of what the ask would be as we got this off the ground, um, the recommendation was to keep it light to begin with um, so that we can use it as a learning opportunity to see how it works um, and then build from there. And that's why this one of the suggestions was to revisit in a set amount of time, be it three, four, six months, whatever the board would like. 
um, to, so we can evaluate how it's going. Got it, great. And on the, uh, the communications internal, uh, kind of with staff and with residents, do you have any thoughts on how that might be functioning or, or who would be involved with that? Is that individual board members uh, to staff? Is it? You mean on the Facebook page? No, sorry, I'm, I'm not the Facebook. Um, the, what I wrote down is that the subcommittee would dissolve. We have kind of um, individual experts, one on more of the Facebook oriented activities, the other more on uh, communications. And I, I thought I heard with staff and residents. Am I not correct with that? With, with residents and Bob, but, uh, or Bob. the town manager, but I think but effectively with staff. And how would you envision that functioning? Who would be involved? Is individual members uh, each reaching to Bob or? So we actually, the, the, the reason this topic had come up two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, um, was the idea of focusing on social media due to COVID communications and the frequency of the board meetings, et cetera, so that the, the board could communicate better with the public. So the focus of our meeting last week was strictly on social media. The idea with disbanding the subcommittee and having two members with each a different communication focus is to help advance the exact thing you mentioned, which is communication with residents, communication with staff, and communication with Bob. And those all would fall under one umbrella. Um, I don't know if this is related, but I'll try, and then you can tell me yes or no. One of the topics we've talked about as being really important as a way to um, follow up on items uh, that have come through from residents and yeah. to kind of have a closed loop. Um, so there's complete follow up and resolution and, and, and notification. Is that one of the things that might fit into there or is that really a different topic? That is squarely within that. And it really, we, I, Bob and I had previously worked before the board um, we we need to pick that up again, or and I, that's I'm not putting that on Bob. I'm putting that on me. Um, need to pick that up again. Got it. So, Mark, to answer your question, it was broached, um, and had talked to Bob about it separately, and we as a subcommittee had talked about it. Um, we just hadn't advanced it far enough. Got it. Other members have questions, comments. Um, I have a question, just to, to be clear, if someone sends a message to the select board, um, how does that um, work vis-a-vis -vis if they sent an email to the whole select board and we all get it and we all see it? So currently the sec or the, or the tradition slash policy currently, I think, provide, allows that the, the secretary provides a preliminary response and that's and then there's not really a very good policy about full follow-up or, or closing the loop individual members might email uh the resident uh bob who is included on all emails to the select board um from time to time and i think with some frequency will respond with information that he has but there's not a consistent response and there's there's no current tracking system for confirming that residents receive a complete response. So the, the thought leader here would work closely with Bob to kind of develop this system and then come back to the board with a suggestion on how to do it and then we talk about it and, and then implement it for a period of time and make sure it works. Yes. Sounds good to me. Uh, Carlo, any questions or comments? I, I guess, you know, is there a, I know you guys have been working on this. Is there a, something on paper we can look at yet? Yes. So the, there is a social media policy that I drafted. It stands at about 10 pages. Uh, a lot of it is uh, more the nitty gritty of, um, disclaimers, um, how it'll be used, who has access, um, which is why it's not, 
I, I'm sort of torn in and I talked about this where does the board review it first or does the town council review it first because there are matters that very clearly need Ray to weigh in and so do we spend you know two hours picking apart a policy that Ray is then going to weigh in on and say well you can't say this or you have to say this and, and it needs to change so there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg situation here as far as the policy goes um, from a practical perspective as far as and, and I'm happy to send it if the board is you know wants some light reading um, but if from from a practical perspective um, ultimately the board needs to decide if we want a social media page um, with these very basic parameters of posting um, the agendas the packet uh, and a link to the YouTube video after the fact and if we want to share COVID specific information on there as well um, that's how we envisioned um, the initial sort of beginning of a Facebook page and then it could evolve however the board would be would want it to okay I just I guess policy I'm itself doesn't actually go down the rabbit hole of what we post and with what frequency etc Bob you have a comment yeah, I've, I've been in the chicken and egg game with Ray, and um, it's going to be helpful if I can explain to him and you can explain to me, what are you trying to accomplish? So to the extent you can come up with some kind of philosophical overview, that would be very helpful. And then if individual members or, or all of you collectively have um, you know, goals or things you want to avoid or whatever color you can provide to me that I can help Ray with uh, is helpful. So I, Cause, cause I do have an introduction. I do have an introduction that may be helpful. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, and, and much of this is borrowed from other towns um, who have done it, so I'm, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Um, as part of the official internet presence with the town of Reading, Massachusetts, the town's social media site will be used by the town and its agents to inform the public of the work, news, and updates of various town departments. The town's social media sites are subject to the same rules as other government publications. Okay, yeah, something, yeah, that'd be very helpful. Okay. So, Bob, I'm happy to send this to you. I, I, my concern is I know, given everything else that's happening in the world, I didn't want Ray to pour over this if the board wanted to review it and pick it apart first. And that's where the, the chicken egg situation comes in where I'm, I'm happy to do whatever makes sense but I, I defer Mark to you as the chair and Bob, you know, however you- I, I would think it would make sense for the, all the board members to have a crack at it in some way, shape okay. or form first. Okay, so Bob, okay. Can send this to you for inclusion in the next packet then? Sure, yep. Mark, yeah, maybe, okay. maybe it'd be good to have um, kind of something a little bit in between what both of you have just said. Great to, to, to kind of weigh in on some of the specifics and how it might work, but also to talk at a high level what are we trying to get done here right. and, and maybe put together the five views and just make sure we're all thinking the same things here and if not we can talk to each other about it and kind of figure it out um, but at the end of the day it, it's you know obviously it's to improve communication is, is is a big deal to be able to speak with one voice going outbound especially related to um, factual information um, and i think number three related to the issue of constituent resolving constituent issues and having a closure and even follow-up system, whatever whatever we're gonna call that. So anyway, we can each, each add our color to that. Um, what do you need from us tonight, if anything, other than the feedback we've already given? I mean, I think before we take any further steps, we need to decide if there is agreement amongst the board that this is a direction we wanna head in. And if the answer is yes, then we need to set aside some time, maybe, maybe not tonight, but we need to create a page and so, Who's going to do that is going to be one of us. It is going to be the staff. Um, so what are we expecting of ourselves and the staff in moving this forward if that is something we want to do? So first is yes or no. And second is how we get there. Because we can create the page without publishing it live. It is, is one of you willing to take a crack at that or would you rather get kind of the uh, four other, or three other bits of feedback first? I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's get the three bits of feedback first. Um, bring that to you. But let's put it on the agenda for next week as kind of continuing the discussion. Um, if we could each think about uh, 
circulate that through Bob, put it in the packet, that'd be great. Maybe we can each take yeah. a look at it, um, think about if there are philosophical issues of what it should do, and then even some more specific things of what it needs to communicate, how it needs to work, be great. Then we can bring that back to you folks and, and, and talk about a next step from there. Bob, I'll send that to you. It's essentially my meeting minutes from our meeting last week. Okay, thanks. Can we move on to the last topic, which will be uh, future agenda? We can talk about near future being next week. <laughs> so um, I think the, the COVID-19 updates are very important. We, we stay with that. The Board of Health is gonna continue to have a person you know, joining with us. Um, we can add, let's add communications back to it. I think that's an important piece of it. Um, the items that we weren't able to, to cover tonight, which really relates to um, the appointments, um, at the boards and committees, liaison roles, the VASC, uh, voting for a couple of members for VASC as part of that. What else would folks like to have on the agenda for next week? I, I just have a question. At, at what point would the board like uh, an update from the town accountant? That's usually quarterly, especially with two new members. Um, I can ask her her availability on Wednesday nights. I don't know that, uh, but that's something to think about. Please, and maybe ask her when she thinks is a good time also, given okay. when she's you know, suddenly kind of has a feel for what's going on or where she needs help. Okay, will do. Um, I have had a couple of residents reach out to me asking about um, <clears throat> the, the gas leak project, the analysis um, with the construction projects being able to continue, um, they, they were asking whether you know a consultant basically he's going to ex execute this by driving around the streets of reading in his car not talking to anyone else might this be something that we would be able to continue with this spring so i didn't know if that would need to be an agenda item or an update or what do you think Bob? um with um with andy and dave andy kind of informally that um you know we had procurement, we had a path, but we needed to have more discussion. And with town hall not open to the public, that discussion's theoretically not, not very easy, I'll say. Um, so if, if you wanna pick up uh, the select board's role with the permission of everyone else, I can talk to you offline about that. Um, you know, as, as you've seen, I've been trying to focus on Main Street in terms of the gas leak issue first. Um, it's up to the town accountant. If we don't have a contract signed by June 30th, it's up to her whether to make town meeting reappropriate funds or whether to carry them forward. And I, I can't answer for her. Um, it's, it's hard to know right now what the best sequence of timing is. If we have a June town meeting, for instance, you know, it, it's just hard to say. Um, you know, we have the money clearly set aside. It's not going to be used for any other purpose through June 30th. So that's not a problem. Bob, don't we normally, um, as standard practice, carry it over once funds are appropriated? No. Um, specifically, if there's no contractual or relationship already arranged, uh, the town accountant will generally not allow that to be carried over. Uh, with the exception of capital. Uh, capital is legally different. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So, um, what if we, as part of the discussion of liaison roles, um, there, there are other categories of things relating to some projects, some of them are building projects, and perhaps this is one that we want to consider as a project also, and then see if the board wants to have one person uh, be the board representative uh, working on it. Does that work? Yeah. Cool. Anything else for next agenda? Hey, Bob, you and I can look and see what else is on the futures stuff and see what, what to... Yeah, not, not much really jumps out at me, Mark, but yeah, I'll give it some thought. Okay. Good. Any, any other things we need to discuss tonight? Are there any uh, boards or committees you'd like to line up for the next few weeks? Uh, line up in what way? Uh, you wanted to have visits? Oh. from the 
chair or from a board, that's something that could, you know, you, we'll need to do some planning. Maybe what we should do is, is talk about how we want to do that. Um, okay. So the boards and committees haven't met in several weeks. I'm right. not sure the timing is right for that yet. Um, yeah, either, either next week or the next or the week after, more likely. I think you're going to get a longer update for the COVID section and, you know, possibly from the whole Board of Health, the whole command staff. Um, you know, once we've gotten through the very busy time, which could be two weeks from now. Um, you know, we may take 45 minutes one of those nights. That's the only group I could think of, but just as an example. Great, thanks. All right, Carlo, do you have a, a motion? Uh, motion to adjourn the meeting. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Ann. All right, Carlo. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Ann. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Vanessa. Yes. Mark, yes. We are adjourned. Thank you, folks. Thank right. you. Good night. Good night. Good night all.